Um, so, hi everybody. It's very, very nice to be here, uh, especially on such a splendid sunny day, which you don't usually expect in London. Uh, weather in London's a lot like the weather in Seattle. You're grateful for every bit of sun that you get. Um, so, um, the, the, um, <clears throat> the whole idea of this master class, as Christina tried to explain to me, was to sort of focus on your work and, and, and uh, interaction uh, between me and you and you and one another, uh, which I'm really, really looking forward to. Uh, and so uh, what I'd like to do today, as Christina suggested, is to sort of set the table for discussions later by uh, saying a little bit about uh, uh, not so much where my work has been, but more like where it's going, uh, because I've done that in the past. I've sort of done recaps of, you know, sort of autobiographical bits and pieces of, of, of my own intellectual formation. But um, uh, for the last, for the last uh, couple of years or so, I've been very much interested in uh, looking at, among other things, the uh, uh, current uh, situation in the Philippines today. And so that's, I just want to say a little bit about that, uh, and, then, and then we can open it up for questions and everybody else can, can do their thing. So <clears throat> uh, now when, when Christina presented me with the title of what I was supposed to talk about, she said, oh, just talk about theoretical approaches. And I said, what? And I said, yeah, I said, it's a little bit over overblown because, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't really do theory as such. Uh, I'm, I'm too much of a historian to just do theory. Uh, instead, uh, you know, I, I, I tend not to live in, in the many mansions uh, of theory, uh, but rather I tend to occupy its slums and its back roads, its out-of-the-way places. And one such out-of-the-way place, of course, is the Philippines. Now, largely, I've been living in a house on the corner of Rodrigo Duterte Street and Michel Foucault Avenue. Um, as my friend Leloy Claudio, who Sharmila, Sharmila of course, also knows, and, and uh, I, I, some of you might know him too, uh, as my friend Leloy Claudio once half facetiously said, Philippine studies lately has become synonymous with Duterte studies. Uh, it seems that you can't talk about the Philippines these days without invariably being asked about Duterte or forced to address current events. In my case, for the last couple of years, I've been uh, doing something very odd, which is I've been teaching in the same quarter, I've been teaching a course on uh, Filipino histories, sort of doing a, a, a survey, uh, which is online, by the way, if you're interested, uh, and at the same time teaching a reading seminar on Foucault. Uh, not surprisingly, the two have become entangled in my mind, for better or worse. So whenever I try to make sense of Foucault, I tend to do so with reference to the Philippines or the United States, so that I call on the one to answer my questions about the other, much like dialing the number of a call center and asking impossible questions during all hours of the day. Somehow, Foucault's relentless focus on Europe, without, however, being Eurocentric, and this is one of the most interesting things about Foucault, is he looks at Europe, but he's never Eurocentric at least in my opinion, helps me see events in the Philippines in a certain way. Take, for example, the question of decolonization, which I know many of you have been involved with, at least from what Christina tells me. The history of Philippine studies with its roots in late 19th century efforts of Filipino nationalists to critique and eventually dispense with Spanish colonial rule can be understood as an exercise in decolonization. It's arguable that the moment you have Philippine studies, you have decolonization. The decolonization is the condition of possibility for having something called Philippine studies. Uh, as with the revolution itself, uh, decolonization has had a long, unfinished history. It has been marked by intractable contradictions, periodic victories, and recurring failures. The vexed history of decolonizing Philippine studies alongside attempts at decolonizing the country is perhaps symptomatic of other related processes. Insofar as it entails what Foucault might call the overthrow of imperial regimes of power and knowledge, decolonization also tends to retain, even as it seeks to transform, colonial social relations by way of their nationalist articulations. In certain respects, decolonization in the Philippines and arguably in other parts of the world remained locked in the inherited ideas of state sovereignty, both in its absolutist and republican versions. It interrogates, even as it sustains, practices and disciplines and surveillance in the construction of norms of citizenship and the time and space of civic life. 
Uh, so, I mean, in other words, the problem with decolonization is the very temporality and the very space of decolonization is still colonial, right? And it can only be a decoloni decolonizing gestures are possible only within that uh, continuously unfolding colonial space. Finally, decolonization in the Philippines and its nationalist and republican versions depends on capitalist development sustained by a particular method of governing uh, that Foucault would later call biopolitics. Capitalist biopolitics, or we might think of as the state practice of national development, right? We know it as national development, but really it's capitalist biopolitics, seeks to produce the economic and social conditions with which to care for the lives of its populations. At the same time, it seeks to ensure the privilege of some to accumulate property and profits in and through the exploitation of the labor of others. To this extent, decolonization also clings to the idea of a punitive state that has the power to kill or let die those it deems to be threats to Filipino society. This is the other side of biopower, bio what Ashil Mbembe, among others, have referred to as necropower. Directly engaged with questions of letting live as well as giving life on the one hand, and putting to death or letting die on the other hand, decolonization allows us to think about the history of the present with reference to Philippine studies as our attempts to understand the Duterte regime. Let me give at least three examples, and I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about these three examples. First example. In the 1973 lectures gathered under the title The Punitive Society, Foucault talks about the major forms of punitive tactics used in France and other places in Western Europe from the 16th century onwards. One of these included marking the body of the guilty, quote, imposing on it a symbolic stain on his name, meant to humiliate his character, damage his status. In the system, the infraction is no longer something to be redressed, but rather something to be emphasized and fixed in a sort of monument, even if it is a scar, an amputation, or something involving shame or infamy. infamy. Now, the idea of punishment as the monumentalization of the guilt is, is, is rather a compelling image. The visible or social body must be a blazon of the penalties, and this blazon refers to two things. On the one hand, to the offense, of which it has to be the visible and immediately recognizable trace. And on the other hand, to the power that imposed the penalty, and that with this penalty has left a mark of its sovereignty on the tortured body. It is not just the offense that is visible on the scar or the amputation, it is the sovereign. Now, anyone familiar with the last two years of the war on drugs will immediately recognize in this punitive tactic the workings of Operation Tokang the process by which suspected drug users are placed on a list, visited by the police, and subsequently gunned down. Their corpses left on the streets as gruesome reminders of their putative crime and as the fearsome sign of the sovereign's power. As hallmarks of the drug war, extrajudicial killings entail a conversion of sorts. The impoverished, impoverished Shabu addict is converted from citizen to social enemy. Its presence, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, this kind of conversion from citizen to social enemy in a second. Its presence is then construed as an absolute menace to society. Beyond cure or rehabilitation, the addict is deemed inhuman and thus bereft of rights. The death of the addict is a way of marking the ex its exclusion, uh, or rather, the death of the addict is a way of marking the exclusion of a social enemy. But by being killed and put on display, the corpse is thereby made to speak about the power of the sovereign. To put it differently, the corpse is included by being excluded. Its death signals its crime, and at the same time, it memorializes the power of the police. Extrajudicial killings are thus a kind of pedagogy, meant to teach the living of the consequences of addiction and the fearsome consequences of offending the king. Right. And Foucault is very clear about this, that the punishment must outstrip the crime, because the punishment is never just about in injuring a particular kind of injury. The crime is always about injuring the sovereign himself. Therefore, the sovereign must respond way beyond proportion of the crime. Right. Now, Foucault makes it a point of saying that increasingly since the 19th century, modern states have tended to shy away from the death penalty as a punitive strategy in favor of uh, the rehabilitation and reform of the criminal. In other words, from prison to penitentiary. And that move from prison to penitentiary is something that's historically been invented by the Quakers in Pennsylvania in the, in the, in the late 18th century. 
So in other words, it's the Christianization of crime that, that Foucault was tracing in the case of Western Europe. But in places like the United States, ironically, where the idea of the penitentiary was invented, this is patently not the case, as the death penalty continues to be practiced, and racialized imprisonment brings with it a permanent stigma and a kind of social death, the loss of voting rights, for example, discrimination in the job market, and so on. In the Philippines, while the death penalty has been officially abolished, it continues to operate in the form of extrajudicial killings carried out by regular as well as private armies, death squads, vigilantes, and the police. The deaths that have resulted from Operation Tokang, ranging from a low of 4,000 to a high of 20,000, have a long history. They were preceded, so in other words, I think part of the historical task is to de-exceptionalize extrajudicial killings and to emphasize the fact that extrajudicial killings have always been an integral part of state government from colonial to nationalist uh, regimes. They were preceded by countless executions under colonial regimes of Spain, the United States, and Japan, and all other post-colonial administrations. The gruesome display of dismembered remains of enemy bodies was standard practice. See, for example, the photographs of dead Filipino fighters during the Filipino-American War, the corpses of Saktalistas in the 1930s, or those of the Hooks, Muslim rebels, and NPA insurgents from the 1950s to the present. As the death, as the death penalty by other means, Operation Tokang continues the ritual of the ancient penalty of torturing and killing uh, bodies of offenders, writing on them the nature of their guilt and the power of those who killed them. As I alluded to earlier, the killings are carefully planned, sustained by a technology of surveillance. Such a technology includes, for example, the making of lists of so-called drug personalities. These lists are put together by LGUs, that is, the local government units that include the Barangay Tanods, or village security forces, one of the most understudied institutions of Philippine society is the Barangay. I mean, really, it's very, very difficult to find really good ethnographic work in the barangay, much less on the security apparatus that the barangay is able to mobilize. Uh, so uh, the lists are put together by LGUs, that is, local government units, that include the barangay tanons or village security forces appointed by the local barangay head. The barangays are given a quota of names of so-called drug personalities, suspe suspected addicts and dealers uh, by the police. It is not clear how or even if these lists are vetted. Anecdotal evidence suggests that a number of those put on the list are not even involved in drugs, but are simply there to fill the quota. Such lists comprise the basic elements for organizing police operations directed at specific people in the community. They are then a kind of order of battle that allows the police, uh, with the aid of vigilante squads, to organize the killings of specific targets. Additionally, the list of drug personalities becomes an avenue for financial gain, and this is very important. Uh, as Sheila Coronel and others have amply documented, the police are given substantial bonuses for each kill they produce. Vigilante squads riding in tandem on motorcycles are also outsourced and paid handsomely to help the police, some of whom moonlight as assassins themselves. Billions of pesos have been set aside by Congress for the presidential and police intelligence, intelligence funds that can then be spent at each agency's discretion with no accountability. And these further provide the financial wherewithal for the kill bonuses. Alongside the financialization of the killings is the commodification of the corpses themselves. Cops get paid commissions for, from, by funeral parlors, some of which they own themselves, uh, for each dead body they call in. Funerals have seen a boom in their, funeral parlors have seen a boom in their businesses. In the absence of a city morgue, all the dead are delivered to privately owned funeral homes where they are processed and cleaned. Each body can cost as much as 50,000 pesos to claim. To the families of the dead, the majority of whom are poor, this is a mind-boggling sum. To raise it, they must go in debt, but more commonly, they hold gambling sessions during wakes, where of course the house gets its cut. Hence, wakes no longer follow a set time period, nine days of viewing, for example, as was the previous custom. Now burials occur whenever enough money has been raised to cover expenses. Indeed, it is not uncommon for funeral parlors to recover some of the cost of processing the bodies by renting out unclaimed corpses to households so that they could give, uh, so it would give them legal cover for holding gambling sessions, inasmuch as the law makes exception for gambling only in the case of funeral wakes. So sometimes you'll see, oh, it's a, ga it's, it's a wake. This is, no, no, they're just renting the body so they can have the gambling session happens. What we see then uh, is that alongside necropower, as the power to kill, 
that is understood to be neither murder nor sacrifice, there is also a necro-economy. Marx once said that under capitalism, money is squeezed from every pore. Thanks to the drug lists, we might add that this includes the bodies of both the living and the dead. The president himself is fond of brandishing such lists and that can contain uh, not just low-level dealers and addicts, but also the names of suspected local officials, such as mayors. While the poor addicts are killed, the more politically and financially well-off are rarely touched, except in two or three spectacular cases, uh, mostly to set as an example. For the most part, the mayors and governors, including police officials are who are supposedly on the list, are left off to, and continue to be protected. The drug lists are thus important instruments of intimidation. They are weapons for striking fear among the poor and rich alike. And the power of such lists come from the fact that they remain largely classified. No one knows for sure who are on the lists, and there is no way one can get oneself off them, even if one is found out to be innocent. To be in the drug list is thus to be guilty regardless of one's innocence. It is to live in perpetual fear that one's time might be coming up. The lists thus derive their power not only from their panoptic nature, they allow the police to see you without you being able to see them, but also from the way they reorganize temporality. Put on the list, one can only be headed not for redemption or rehabilitation, but for a final reckoning. In sum, the current practice of EJKs as realized through the tactics of Tokang are not a retrograde throwback to some feudal past, but part of a post-EDSA style of governing that has emerged since the overthrow of Marcos. It thrives, on set, uh, it thrives in a setting where the legal system is profoundly politicized, courts are backed up, and judges as well as police are badly paid, while the majority of the population are poor. And given the financial incentives that accompany the killings, one can see how EJKs comprise a sort of necro-economy uh, that is necessary uh, for intensifying necro-power. Indeed, we can think of EJKs, as its name implies, as a kind of violent, arbitrary form of justice, extrajudicial, yeah, the judicial part. Uh, as a, form, a form of arbitrary form of justice in a place where justice is often delayed and diverted. Setting aside the uncertain and time-consuming process of court trials and the difficult task of protecting human rights, EJKs insist on a different temporal and moral order, one where punishment is swift, visible, and unassailable. It is, of course, a justice that is steeped in injustice, one that is characteristic of the drug war and perhaps all wars. And that's why it's possible for the administration to defend EJKs, because they say, what do you want? You want drug addiction or you want to take care of the problem? If you want to take care of the problem and you want to go to the courts, it's going to take forever. This way, it's over, finished. The equivalent of this would be if you incur a traffic violation and then the cop comes, asks for your license, and says, how are we going to do this, right? You can wait six months to get your license or you can give me something for my merienda, right? And then we settle it. You know, for him, that's justice. What you give him is not a bribe, it's a fee. And it's a fine. It's the fee and the fine. The fine that you would have paid anyway, and the fee for speeding up the service. If that's not just, I don't know what is. So the argument goes. And you can see how this can be escalated and scaled up to apply to Tokang. Now, this brings me to my second example of what might be possible when thinking about the Philippines alongside Foucault. The matter of war itself, right? The drug war, the war part. Now, the tradition of liberal democracy in the Philippines, like that in the West, is fragile and daily upended. One of the most problematic aspects of liberal democracy is the notion that war and peace are two separate and distinguishable moments. Foucault has on many occasions pointed out the error of this way of thinking. War is not something that stops once peace is established. Neither is war something that happens out there, outside of society. It does not end when everyone decides to enter into a social contract and give up part of its sovereignty to a representative king or a representative body who can then make laws and adjudicate conf conflicts. Peace is not the natural state that succeeds war, whereby laws guided by norms and rights are administered beyond politics. For Foucault, there is nothing beyond the political, and this is the limits in the, the, the debates around C.J. Serrano. Uh, the, 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 the sort of the, the co warrant and so forth. The assumption of the critics is that law should be separate from politics. It's like, what utopian universe do you exist? Uh, do you live in where you think that law and politics can be, you know, sort of sufficiently and justifiably separated? It just doesn't happen. Uh, 
Wherever there is, uh, so for Foucault, there is nothing beyond the political. Invoking Clausewitz against Hobbes and Locke, Foucault argues that war is politics by other means, and politics is war by other means. Wherever you have power relations, you have inequalities, oppressions, and struggles that at times explode into armed uprisings, and at other times manifest themselves in electoral campaigns, polemical tracts, social movements, dictatorships, coups, and the myriad varieties of insubordinations. In short, inasmuch as social relations are constituted by variegated webs of power relations alongside res the resistances they call forth, they always take on warlike nature. For Foucault, unlike Marx, the warlike relations that pervade and infuse social relations are not simply based on class differences. Rather, class war is subsumed into a larger civil war, whereas class war imagines society as riven by a death struggle between those who own the means of production and those whose only possession is their labor power. The concept of civil war stresses the relational, contingent nature of power relations. In civil wars, what we see are intra-class linkages and alliances. Often, these unfold as a series of factional rifts where rich and poor, middle class and working class, are allied against other similarly constructed factions, reckoned less along ideological lines as on the axis of dynastic or familial affiliations. We see this, for example, in the cross-class alliances among the fiercest supporters of the president, the Duterte Diehard Supporters, or DDS, a play on the Davao death squads that Duterte himself allegedly authorized. The DDS are self-proclaimed children of Tatae, or Daddy Duterte, and are made up of the aspirational middle class, especially overseas Filipino workers, old as well as new oligarchs, supporters and family members of President Marcos, Aquino, Ramos, Estrada, and Macapagal Arroyo. They include the working classes and lumpens from the police, to slum dwellers, among whom come the great majority of the victims of the drug war. Such alliances are organized hierarchically as dispersed and mobile clusters of patron-client ties and fungible personality cults that cultivate among its members aspirations of upward mobility as well as fears of becoming downwardly mobile. Such hopes and fears in turn tend to generate intense fantasies of patriarchal order and dreams of an authoritarian utopia with which to protect its members from real or imagined threats. Now such threats of course are figured as social enemies. In civil wars, class enemies are supplanted by social enemies, those who pose an existential threat to society and who can come from any class, the monstrous dictator, for example, his cannibalistic wife, or the humanoid drug addict, the immoral female senator, and more recently, the corrupt female chief of justice of the Supreme Court, and so on. So to, in this context, we can think of EDSA I and EDSA II as examples of civil war. So too, with certain qualifications, were the revolution of 1896, the Filipino-American War, the war against Japan. All of these were less class wars as civil wars, pitting Filipinos against other Filipinos from other classes who either resisted against or collaborated with colonial rulers. Duterte, of course, learned his political chops while serving as mayor of a factionalized Davao, where civil war was the norm rather than the exception. And even before that, he was a law student at San Beda College, where, as with all law schools, fraternities and their hyper-masculine culture shaped Duterte's violent political outlook. Fraternities operate like gangs where neophytes are brutally initiated and members taught to absolutely obey their masters and aspire to be absolute masters themselves through a combination of coercion and mutual aid. I mean, in some ways, fraternities are breeding grounds for uh, uh, sort of authoritarianism. As a mayor of Davao, Duterte sought to co-opt the deadliest forces unleashed by President Cory Aquino's vicious anti-communist campaign, the death squads, as well as former members of the New People's Army. Integrating these armed groups into the local police force, Duterte controlled and commanded an impressive killing machine that carried out his, victim, his, his bidding, clearing Davao of both its lumpen criminal elements, uh, though not its largest drug dealers and smugglers, including homeless children, political foes, and the occasional hostile journalist. Thanks to his war against crime and drugs, Duterte uh, Davao gained a reputation for safety and security, however uh, uh, sort of spurious. Now, since becoming president in 2016, Duterte has sought to nationalize his style of governing. Rejecting the universalizing discourses of human rights, for example, he has put forth a kind of militant provincialism and unapologetic parochialism. 
As we saw, he has also insisted on his sovereign prerogative to conduct a war on drugs free from foreign and Filipino criticism. While EJKs have been the most dramatic tactic in Duterte's civil war, there is another tactic that I want to look at. In the time I have left, I want to examine his tactic of joking and his use of obscenities in his speeches. Duterte is known by his supporters as the Punisher. His punitive approach to governing includes telling jokes that disarm his audiences, often reducing them to laughter, as he names and shames his critics, often foreign and female. It is a style developed while hosting what was then the most popular TV show in Davao, which you can actually download from YouTube. It's, very, you know, it's all on YouTube. Gikan Samasa para Samasa, for, from the masses for the masses, while serving as mayor. Those who oppose Duterte have called him out on his use of obscenities and misogynistic remarks. But insofar as Duterte is concerned, his sexual banter is yet another way of asserting his sovereignty. It enacts his freedom from the constraints of responsibility, norms, and decency. Unrestrained, he takes great de delight in spewing profanities. He recounts body stories about masturbation. He jokes about rape. He publicly admires women's anatomy and makes references to vaginal odor and much more. In so doing, he has shown that he will not be bound by the norms of decency or delicadeza, uh, as his opponents insist, just as he refuses to abide by the laws of due process and the protection of human rights. Duterte, to put it crudely, doesn't give a fuck and has long run out of fucks to give. To quote him directly, tanginan That is, you're all sons of bitches. For the president then, or you're all motherfuckers, because that's how tangina really should translate as motherfuckers. For the president then, part of his executive privilege includes the freedom to take pleasure in joking and shaming, turning them into important weapons. That he manages to hit his targets is indicated in the anger he steers among his opponents and the endearment he generates uh, from his supporters. Breaking from protocol and the conventions of resp respectability endows the president with a rebellious quality in the eyes of the DTS. It confirms, it confirms to them that he is unlike anyone from the previous administration. As a bad boy who commands the room with his menacing charm, his flurry of invectives and sexual innuendos, Duterte seems excessive. It is precisely this excess that places him beyond convention and law, endowing him with power over those who are otherwise obligated to defer his authority. In his presence, they must observe proper behavior and attend to his authority, while he himself seems to flaunt every rule. Herein lies one explanation, I think, for Duterte's continuing popularity. To his supporters, his coarse language and body humor are seen body, body, body humor are seen as forms of defying what has been prescribed by the establishment, establishment elites. His blasphemies directed at the Catholic Church, for example, pointing out the corruption and perversion of the, the clergy is often followed by hilarious retellings of the sexual abuse he suffered as a youth, literally in the hands of an American Jesuit in Davao. For rather than paint himself as a victim, Duterte turns the story of abuse into a vehicle for ridic ridiculing confession, associating the ritual with masturbation. After Duterte tells the story, you can never think of confession without thinking about masturbation. Uh, similarly, Duterte has projected an image of himself as both a homophobe and a homophile, during the presidential campaign of 2016, for example, he derided his opponent, Mar Rojas's masculinity, implying that he was too gay to be president. However, he also surrounded himself with LGBTQ supporters. At one point in his campaign, he had a remarkable interview on the TV show of the most popular trans entertainer in the country, Vice Ganda, where he lost no time flirting with her and confided that as a young man, he often thought that he could be gay. Furthermore, his administration has a number of visibly queer folks who count themselves as his most ardent supporters, such as Moka Uson, RJ Nieto, and Sa Sasot. Thus, when Duterte jokes and cusses, he engages in a form of dissipation, allowing his desires to surface and his impulses to take over. Breaking taboos, he surrenders to what is usually forbidden, something that children do but which adults are expected not to. He performs a kind of infantile regression, lashing out at his enemies and shaming them with allusions to their sexuality. Listening to his speeches, which are all online, by the way, if you want to, uh, and, and they're all transcribed. Listening to his speeches, which when delivered in front of local audiences, usually begin with the act of throwing away his prepared speech and appearing to speak off the cuff, one is plunged into shifting linguistic registers, polemical tirades, abrupt beginnings and endings. 
In his speeches, he often sounds like someone who seems intoxicated by his ability to act out his intoxication. Foucault writes uh, uh, what he calls the two great illegalities that characterize the advent of the modern age and that threaten the newly dominant bourgeoisie in Europe, depredations and dissipations. The first was easier to police, Depredations consisting of such acts as piracy, smuggling, and various other forms of property theft require stealth, calculation, and circuits of distribution. In short, an organized economy and a political rationality. For this reason, depredations were easily codified as crimes by the 19th century, while the bourgeoisie carved out all sorts of exceptions that would legalize their own predatory acts. Dissipation, however, was a different matter. It was about indulging in excess and irrationality through drunkenness, intoxication, and forbidden sexual relations. It also meant engaging in festivities, taking pleasure in games of chance, such as gambling, and various other activities that could not be transformed into profit. The dissipator was regarded as lazy, one who wasted time, or better yet, kept time to him or herself. This hoarding and wasting of time violated the capitalist demand that one surrender to the disciplinary demands of production, which meant, above all, converting the time of life into the time of profit. By refusing to give in to the tyranny of clock and calendar, dissipators came across as dangerous elements threatening the order of things. They were to be sequestered and trained in the army and schools and prison and factories, where their bodies could be retooled from sites of pleasure into repositories of labor power. Duterte, in taking on the, uh, the role of the dissipator-in-chief, thumbs his nose at all these bourgeois demands. He will not be disciplined. Instead, he becomes a sort of trickster figure who entertains by veiling his aggression with jokes and obscenities. As a trickster, Duterte plays the role of the payaso, or the clown, uh, who is a staple character in the traditional comedia, who made fun of those in power, while tapping also into the Visayan figure of the bugoy, the idler and the vagrant, associated with the lumpen or standby, who literally sees things from below while sitting on his bum, for example, at the corner Sari Sari store, calling out the pretensions to respectability of those that walk by. In assuming the role of the trickster, Duterte converts dissipation into an instrument of power. Uh, his dissipatory behavior has a preemptive effect. He is able to criticize the authority of anyone who would dare criticize his authority. He steals, as it were, the comedic resources of his opponents, preempting their playfulness and commanding the laughter of his supporters. These supporters, in turn, are drawn to Duterte's style of political engagement, emulating it as a tactic for dealing with his critics by reducing the latter to caricatures ripe for vicious attacks. From cruel stereotyping, it is indeed a small step to declaring critics as social enemies. Here, uh, and here just to finish up, hence the two aspects of Rodrigo Duterte's governing style. He is the sovereign who decides on the exception, setting aside law and putting certain groups to death. But he is also the trickster who, in disarming his critics, endears himself to his supporters as a dissipator par excellence, one whose excessive performance gives expression to what is at once forbidden yet desired. In the first case, he recruits the bodies of dead addicts into signs of his fearsome authority that brooks no limits. In the second case, he transforms himself into the embodiment of the dissipator who rejoices in his irre irreverence and irresponsibility. He thereby conjures the illusion of evading the time of capitalist capture and actively embraces the charges of stupidity leveled by his critics, all the while, like the trickster, knowing that he's the one who's really outsmarted them. The tactical advantage that Duterte enjoys, at least for the moment, comes precisely from his ability to craft an impossible image, one that is both sovereign and trickster, in doing so, he assuages the fears of precarity and displacement among many of his supporters. Whether newly rich, aspiring middle classes, or working poor, they find themselves daily burdened by the pressures and humiliations brought about by the demand for discipline and conformity in a neoliberal state, whether in the Philippines or in the case of OFWs among his strongest supporters abroad. Duterte's double image, what I'm tempted to call, paraphrasing Ernest Kantorowicz's great book on medieval kingship, as the, Datu, the Datu's two bodies. Uh, this speaks to the anxieties of his supporters, 
who find themselves unable to escape from the temporal demands of capital, even as they seek security from those now deemed by Duterte to be their social enemies. It is, an, it is as an authoritarian trickster, not an authoritarian populist, but an authoritarian trickster operating under the conditions of neoliberal development that Duterte is able to consolidate his hold and pursue his civil war against all those who oppose him. As to how long and to what effect are questions best answered, no doubt, at another time. Thank you. We have time? Yeah? Yeah. Thanks so much for that. That was a fantastic talk. I really appreciate it. Um, the thing about the trickster figure, though, the trickster is normally liminal. So yeah, yeah. What happens when that you know, liminal figure kind of enters into this sovereign state where it's yeah. there every day and there's no kind of in betweenness to it? So, how does you know, the sovereign would normally have yeah. a trickster figure which would be playing off and coming back and forward? So yeah. Yeah. How it actually then stays within the everyday and the strict figure doesn't have to then fall away and eat shit like they normally yeah. have to do. Yeah. You mean that the, the, the double the double figure yeah, so of sovereign. So how Duterte remains like is able to hold the trickster that, that, with that's, yeah. without it. Yeah, I, I was trying to work out that argument this morning because I thought about that too. Um, and I think that has that this is why he needs to kill addicts. Because the addict is in some ways exactly that. The addict is the sovereign and the trickster. How is the addict sovereign? In his mind, the addict is sovereign because the addict is completely devoted to his or her addiction, to the point that they don't care about social conventions. All they want is to pursue their desire to get high. They will kill, they will rape, they will steal, they will do anything. In other words, they locate themselves above the law. And that's exactly what a sovereign does. So for Duterte, he uh, sees that as competition. That's my suspicion. He sees those kinds of figures as competition, and therefore they must be killed. And in killing them, he then appropriates, uh, not, he appropriates their power. But the, and what is that power? It's a power connected with death. The problem is you can't really possess death the way you can possess life, right? Death is death, and death has a kind of receding, infinite quality about it. So he needs to kill again. Now, if this sounds like the zombie, I mean, it is. It's, it's sort of like the, you know, the zombie sort of situation where the zombie is never content with killing just one person. He or she has to keep killing, right? And keep uh, appropriating uh, whatever power that that person has. So I, I think this is why, uh, if, if you read what he says about addicts, I mean, first of all, he addresses them as you. He never says, oh, all the, you know, these addicts need to be, he always says, you have to you know, watch yourself, you will be killed, you better stop. I mean, it's, it's an I-you relationship, as it were. So he takes it very personally. And what that suggests to me, that the fact that he addresses them as a you, means that he sees himself as, in fact, interchangeable, as substitutable with addicts. The addict represents a kind of mirror image of himself, which isn't really too far-fetched when you think of the fact that Duterte himself has been addicted to opioids, right? He himself is an addict. He himself has spoken openly about what a wonderful experience it is to be high. So he's not, he's not, you know, uh, he's not uh, completely estranged. So I think that's, that's, that's where the question of the, of the addict comes in and why he needs to keep killing them, why he's obsessed with their deaths. Yeah. It sounds like a bad movie script, but, and maybe it is, I don't know. You know. Yes? So my question is sort of related to this. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure how new it is. I think I suspect there's a lot more continuity than, than, than rupture between Aquino and Duterte. Um, what's changed is the tone, right, and the visibility of the violence, but that all regimes are violent. All regimes engage in extrajudicial killings of one sort or the other. Uh, 
for, for, for you know, either greater rates or, or lesser rates. Uh, all regimes survive precisely in this combination of, of what, I, what Foucault refers to as biopower and necropower, right? Um, and so in that sense, I, you know, because side by side with Duterte's sort of obsession with addicts is his commitment to development. So in that sense, he's not unlike other Philippine presidents, except he pivots towards China instead of the usual suspects like the EU and the United States. Uh, but his dependence on China is in some ways not that different from other presidents' dependence on the United States and the EU, right? It just, again, it comes across as something that uh, seems different, in part because it flies in the face of deep-seated anti-Chinese uh, feelings among the Filipinos. Right? Filipinos are very anti-Chinese. Uh, and so for them to see him now buddying up with China, uh, you know, sort of rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but it's consistent with the sort of attempt of Duterte to appear to be unconventional, but in fact his unconventionality is utterly conventional if seen in the long durée of, of, of uh, post-war post -war Philippine politics, right? So that would be my, my response to that. I mean, uh, in other words, the question makes sense if it, in fact it is a different regime, but I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it is. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. You know. I mean, critics of Duterte would get very pissed at me if I said that. Right? But by the way, this is part of the challenge too. It's not just to criticize Duterte, but to criticize the critics of Duterte, right? who seem fairly, especially in the Philippines, who seem very bound to what I think of as a sort of uh, 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 moral critique of Duterte. You know, they think that by calling out Duterte as immoral, as bad person, as a murderer, violator of human rights, that's sufficient. But the other side of that is, as far as Duterte and his supporters are concerned, what they're doing is, in fact, uh, uh, s consistent with a particular ethical outlook. That is to say, we're delivering justice, we're making you safe, we're providing security. What's your problem? Right? And if you criticize me, all you're doing is you're undermining me, and therefore you're undermining the country, and therefore you're essentially a subversive, and you should be persecuted. It's just what he's done with Dilema and all these other people. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm just very curious about how you think Duterte has managed to reconcile this investment of his in like constructing himself as the sovereign, as a strong man of sorts. Yeah. But also, like, there are very apparent forms of political indebtedness to China and Marco. Absolutely, yeah. And they are quite influential in this. So maybe sometimes he's been, like, he's explicitly admitted this. And a lot of the critics then turn this imagery on its head. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're basically um, to Danny Marcos, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. So how does he like negotiate and reconcile this and still come out of top looking like a sovereign yeah. leader anyway? Um, yeah, that's a good question. My guess is he doesn't lose any sleep over it. He doesn't. He doesn't. He does not give a fuck. It's as, as simple as that. They say, oh, you're being contradictory. You're, you know, a lapdog and blah, blah. He doesn't care. You've never heard him. You've never heard him make an excuse for his fealty towards China. You've never heard him ex make an excuse about his closeness to the Marcoses. You know? And, and in, in a way, that speaks to the sort of tactical advantage that he's managed to carve out. That he doesn't have to respond and doesn't have to take seriously his critics. And that's what annoys his critics to no end. Because his critics, especially those in the elite, are so used to being taken seriously, right? They're so used to being able to speak on behalf of the nation. And all of a sudden, here's a whole chunk of the nation that says, we don't have to listen to you. You don't matter. And what are they going to do? Oh, let's plan a coup. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Give me a break. The Philippine military is not the Thai military. Thai military is very good at coups. Philippine military, uh-uh, zero. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 so yeah. That, that image, you yeah, know, the, yeah. Kind of the low level, yeah, uh, right yeah, the yeah, top, yeah. Kind of like speeding up justice. So yeah. I kind of, I, I can't see the spaces in between. I love that image. I wonder if you could just. Kind of 
Yeah, there's just there's, there's, there's a there's some really interesting work that's being done by uh, some of you might know him, Stefan Jensen. He's a Danish anthropologist who's based in Aarhus. In fact, I'm going to see him after this talk. And they've been doing all this really interesting ethnography of the police. And they're doing something very interesting that very few people have done, which is they've actually talked with the police, the individual low-level patrolmen, and asked them, how do you do your work? How do you come to terms with it? And so forth. And they've sort of reconstructed what you might call an ethics of policing. You know, uh, an ethics of policing which consists of saying that what they get is, a, precisely, it's not a bribe, it's a fee in exchange for a service, and it's a fine that they otherwise would have paid. So, for example, in, in particular, and, and much of their ethnographic work has been in um, uh, uh, Bagong Silang, which is a, a barangay off Commonwealth. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's like they have all these case studies, very interesting case studies, where uh, there's this very telling one of a, a, a middle-class journalist is coming home, he's very tired, he runs and, and hits poor kid, you know, he's crossing the street from the slums. And the kid is seriously injured, so, you know, neighbors come, what's going on, they threaten him, police comes, breaks up the, what could have been a, a, a nasty situation. He puts the kid and the mom, they go off, they go off to the hospital, and then he has to go back to the prison, I mean, he has to go back to the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, um, the police station. But instead of putting him in, in prison, in, in the city jail where all the sort of riffraffs are, they see that he's got a car, uh, he's you know, middle class, so they just let him kind of wander around, and in exchange, uh, as, as, as a sign of gratitude for the kind of liberties they've allowed, allowed him, he goes out, buys some snacks, buys some cigarettes, and so forth. And so quickly, there's a kind of recipro reciprocal relationship that's built up between the two of them, right? And, uh, and then the next day, another cop comes, and uh, to, make, to make a long story short, he, they take him to the hospital, he sees the kid, the mother is, you know, sort of frantic because the kid is, you know, kind of in serious situation. And so they strike a deal, thanks to the policeman, where he pays the hospital bills of the kid, right? Uh, and then, uh, and, so, and so the mom is happy with that. He goes back to the prison, uh, to the precinct, and of course he's more than happy to pay the bribe, to, to pay the fee to the policeman, and they let him go, right? Justice is done. So what that suggests in a situation like that is what we think of as corruption and bribery is, are in fact sites for the expeditious administration of justice, where reciprocal relations can be formed, negotiations can be hammered out, everybody comes away with something. The mother has money to pay for the hospital fees, uh, the cops, uh, are paid off for facilitating that arrangement, keeping him out of prison, and saving him from having to wait for going to trial, right, and so on and so forth. So, so the, these are these are all the you know different, and, and they have they have all these different stories where you read and you go, oh, okay, well, in a situation where you have to wait six months to a year before your case can even come into trial, where judges, municipal judges, for example. Uh, are paid, not only are they paid very low, but if you get appointed as a municipal judge in the Philippines, it takes at least six months before you get your first paycheck. Six months, what are you gonna do with six months, right? Um, and so what looks like bribery, what looks like corruption, are in fact sites for the administration of justice. But, you know, from another perspective, you would say, well, that's the mafia theory of life, right? <laughs> it is a gangster theory. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it really is gangster, gangster life. I mean, this is Donald Trump, right? So, but in the absence of other institutions, countervailing institutions, what are you going to do? So what's the answer? The answer is to have these countervailing institutions that make these unnecessary. But how are you going to get there? That's the problem. So in the meantime, you got Duterte. And Duterte seems to embody precisely this sort of expeditious, extrajudicial, as it were, delivery of services of, of, of hope, of whatever, you know, so, yeah. And I think that's, that's why he's so popular, and unless you come to terms with that, it's very difficult to understand what's going on in the country right now. And then you historicize it. You historicize it, and you realize, well, it's coming from somewhere. It's not something that just happened when he got elected, you know. It has, uh, it's an ongoing thing that uh, probably was there from Quezon's time, and probably even before that. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because unlike South, uh, unlike, for example, Indonesia or Thailand, where the military has a more primary role. Yeah, yeah. In the Philippines, it's not, <coughs> in a sense, in terms of how it yeah. goes in, in politics, but there is that underlying support. Yeah. It's, it's, never really, it's never really explicated because for some reason, I believe, it's kind of, the dynamic is still the same. Yeah. I'd like, to, I'd like to know if you, if you have ideas of, of, of what's happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not as familiar with the situation in the military, except that, you know, people who know better than me <coughs> claim that the military has changed. It's much more professional. Um, uh, it's still pro-American uh, in many cases, and they're still very suspicious of China. So that's, that's a bone of contention between Duterte and the military. On the other hand, um, there is no taste for a coup, absolutely none, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, so in that sense, uh, and Duterte has gone out of his way to sort of placate and mollify uh, the, 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 the troops himself. Right? One of the things, first things he did when he was elected was to visit all the different camps and to sort of hang out with them. And, you know, so, so the troops themselves, the, the, the sort of low-level soldiers, you know, all, he's very popular with them, right? You mean with the police? Yeah. yeah. There was no public, um, you know, um, crucifixion. No, no, no. The police, the police are all. I mean, they're they're yeah. golden. They're golden, right? I mean, there there might be a trial. There might be a Senate hearing. Uh, there might be like gestures towards suspending or punishing them, but they they always get back. I mean, it's just, you know those Kaloogan cops that killed Kian. I mean, they're back. Uh, that that guy Marcos who killed the, the mayor, he's back. You know, so there are no consequences. Then he will he will occasionally sort of. Uh, try to frighten yeah. certain cops who are supposed to Lo Ot, for example, from yeah. Cebu. Yeah. He's still there, right? So it, it's like you know he, he talks he talks a good game, but when it comes to the the, the those those on top, he, he's not going to touch. He's not going to touch them. I mean, the people who those, those cops who killed who killed the Korean businessman, uh, they're still there. Yeah. Nothing's really happened, right? Um, no, but if you're the poor Shabu addict, forget it. Right. So, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm interested with your idea of the state of exception. Yeah. A lot of Carl Schmitt in terms of how he sees the sovereignty yeah. beyond or beyond the constitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How you, yeah. Um, I think about your ideas in, with, with regards to the territory in terms yeah. of how he always envisions himself as a sovereign and in terms of how it's how it's sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. There, there's very much a parallelism yeah. in what's happening in the Philippines. Yeah. He acts himself yeah. one way as a traditionalist yeah. or populist. Yeah. But also during times of crisis, yeah. he is the sovereign that decides on the state of exception. Yeah. And he embodies that with, with of course, his performance. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very powerful in the way in the, the way in which he um, communicates with the cow. Like you directly, it, he is the sovereign that. Yeah, no. No, I mean, it, it, well, theorize and historicize. You know, so 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 again, it, it, when he says that, you know, he's above the law. Uh, what he really means is he is the law. It's not that he's above the law, but he's above the law so that he can set the law because he is himself the law, 
right? That's right, that's right. And so Congress will let him do it because, because he owns the Congress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, uh, so, so in that sense, it's not, it's not so much about, uh, uh, I mean, there's certainly that as, the, the Schmittian, Schmittian aspect of, of sovereignty that's at play there. Um, but then, like I said, if you historicize this, if you historicize this, I mean, you can see this sort of playing itself out as far back as pre-colonial, I mean, arguably pre-colonial period with the Datus, right? Um, and and you, you can sort of think about it in, in terms of, you know, uh, the tradition of, of absolute rule introduced by the Spanish king, right? I mean, if you read, if you read the laws of the Indies, I mean, it's very much a, a sort of, a, sort of a, a, a discourse on, on absolutism, right? Um, so, I mean, you can say that, that Spanish absolutism uh, is, still, is still part of the infrastructure of, of politics in the Philippines today. And the idea of the sovereign as he who takes exception is not exceptional at all, but in fact is the rule. So, you know. But I think there was one, did you want to ask? Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry what the last part was. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, you're absolutely right in the sense that uh, the pattern, the pattern with Duterte is that uh, he will not, he may threaten the big drug lords, but in the end he doesn't. We do any Peter Lim from Cebu, for example, is his good friend, um, and many others. Um, there are all this talk about Paulo Duterte, his son, who is himself been uh, is supposedly actively involved in. Right now, he's under investigation by the ombudsman. Right, so um, uh, his sister has sort of intimated that Duterte himself is involved. So I mean, there's all these. This and and the thing is, you know, if I had more time, I would have wanted to sort of root this in the history of what so-called gray economy in Mindanao, uh, the illegal or gray economy in Mindanao that pe people like uh, Pancho Lara and various other people have written about. Uh, and it's a very interesting relationship between sort of illegal and the illegal and the legal that, that in places like the Philippines, and arguably anywhere, including the UK, right, that you can't talk about the legal without talking about the illegal, that the illegal and the legal uh, are sort of dialectically related, one enabling the other, right? Uh, and and that uh, uh, one 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 can't really think about political power except in relation to this this, this dialectical interplay between the legal and the illegal. Uh, so you know it's it's the, the idea of drug lords as part and parcel of the larger governing architecture of the Philippines. You know, I'll, I'll tell you another place where, where, where you can see this is it, it, the surge in in uh, the casino industry. So all these casinos coming up, right? And you know, this is a very interesting report that came out from uh, these, these folks from Reuters once. Wrote this, this, this report that's saying that, that the casino, one of the reasons why, why uh, uh, casinos are so important is because, uh, as you know, they're important places to launder money, right? Uh, a lot of the drug money gets laundered in casinos, and uh, there's, there is a practice where much of the shabu is cooked in offshore ships by Chinese uh, cooks, as it were, and then picked up by small bankas. And, and, and taken to the, the Philippines very easy because of the archipelagic nature. So many different places where you could drop off the shabu. They're loaded onto vans. The vans are then driven to the parking lot of various casinos where they're parked beside an identical looking van filled with money. And they simply, I mean, it's like a bad movie. It's, it's really a you know, B, B movie, right? And then they simply exchange the keys. And then of course the money is laundered by the casino, no questions asked because you know, they're not going to touch the casinos because they're, they're an important uh, sort of element in the tourist industry, right? So you have sort of this interesting constellation of drugs, casino, economy, tourism, politics. I mean, where do you start? Really, where do you start? If, if, you, if you begin to, to pull on the threads of one, the whole thing comes unraveled. The whole thing comes undone. Right? So, I mean, it's very fascinating. But it's also, from, from, from a sort of, you know, uh, political perspective, it's also very frustrating. But that's, you know, 
So we need better stories and better movies. <laughs> I said, there's like a million and one movies that could be made from this. Anyway, I should stop and let other people talk. Right, thank you very much for the introduction and good morning everyone. My name is Natalie Kobo and I'm a first year part-time. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Great. Also, do please gesticulate if I start talking too quickly and uh, it doesn't help. Um, so my name is Natalie and I'm a first year part-time PhD student in history at the University of Oxford. And my thesis is entitled Conversion, Ethnology and Law in the Early Modern Philippines. My background is in classics, but after completing my master's, I became involved in a translation project through which I developed an interest in religious conversion in the early modern world, particularly within the context of the Spanish Empire. In the other part of my time, as it were, I work at the Max Planck Institute for European Legal History in Frankfurt, where I'm translating De Gobernatione, a legal treatise by the 17th century Spanish jurist Juan de Solorzano Pereira from Latin into English and Spanish. This treatise, authored by the same man who helped compile the first collection of the laws pertaining to the Indies in the Spanish Empire, is the most detailed guide about how to govern Spain's overseas territories and the legal basis behind it all. For the Habsburg monarchy at the very least, it is the most comprehensive description of how colonial government is supposed to work in theory. I also work with a non-profit organization, Neo Granadina, which digitizes historical archives and libraries in Colombia with the intention of making the resulting images available online for free. This work has brought me into close contact with scholars of the New Kingdom of Granada, the area which roughly corresponds to modern day Colombia, working on a similar period to that which I am interested in. So this morning I would like to talk to you all about my PhD project, explaining the three main themes of my investigation, discussing the reasons why I'm interested in them and why I think that they are worth exploring, and describing some of the sources that I intend to use to do so. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your feedback afterwards, as I'm very grateful for this wonderful opportunity, really, uh, to be attending this workshop with so many specialists of the Philippines and Southeast Asia. So broadly speaking, I'm interested in understanding the processes involved in establishing Spanish colonial society in the Philippines, in analysing the impact that the conquest had on Filipino societies, and in thinking about what this reveals more broadly about the institutional framework of the, and workings of the Spanish Empire in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Philippines has never fitted easily into the historiography of the early modern Spanish Empire. Its distinct geography and the attendant differences, its distance from the crown, its comparatively late conquest, and its large cosmopolitan population have separated it from Spanish territories in America and have isolated it from, horror, from historiographical trends in Latin American scholarship. This separation was reinforced by its distinct trajectory following the expulsion of the Spanish at the end of the 19th century. However, I believe that it is important to examine these processes of conquest and colonization within this broader context, thinking about other parts of the Spanish Empire, as well as Portuguese expansion in the area, to consider what the similarities and differences reveal about Iberian empires in this period. I believe that this will help contextualize the nature of Spanish colonialism in the Philippines, really throwing into contrast those things that were distinct and trying to consider the reasons why they were so, which in turn enables us to think about what the Philippines reveals about the logics of Spanish imperialism. To do so, I intend to explore three main themes. Firstly, I shall look at how indigenous societies were understood by Spaniards. Secondly, I will examine how, regardless of how misconstrued these impressions were, Spaniards sought to change these societies to make them correspond to their understanding of civilized Catholic subjects and the extent to which change was affected or at least perceived to have been affected. Finally, I would like to think about these processes in relation to other peripheral and under-resourced territories within the Spanish Empire and the broader Southeast Asian context. The first part of my research will examine how indigenous societies were understood by Spaniards. Missionary records, especially chronicles, have long been key sources for attempting to understand pre-Hispanic indigenous cultures, but there has been a tendency to cherry-pick information without considering the epistemological frameworks particularly the use of classical models and contemporary templates for writing ethnologies which shaped them. By situating these texts within this broad intellectual framework, I intend to analyze the processes by which Europeans attempted to fit unfamiliar societies into an intelligible worldview, and to consider the homogenizing effect that this had on the diverse societies of the Spanish Empire. 
I will also look at letters and reports written by Laban and the correspondence of missionaries to see if they reveal a different picture from these official chronicles. I shall read both sets of these sources alongside anthropological literature on the Philippines and Southeast Asia in, order to, in an effort to reconstruct something of the indigenous logics which might have been at work and to indicate possible areas of incommensurability and misunderstanding. No matter how misconstrued, however, ethnological knowledge had a practical function because it was used to determine what needed to be changed in order to transform local people into the Spanish vision of civilized Catholic subjects. Having tried to determine the ways in which indigenous societies were perceived, the second part of my project will analyze the negotiation which involved in establishing a colonial society in this distant, under-resourced territory, and to analyze the impact of the conquest by considering if and how it changed indigenous societies. I am particularly interested in the role of the Catholic Church in this process and the impact of evangelization, the ways in which indigenous elites were incorporated into the colonial order, and how Filipinos engaged with secular institutions. I will look at legislation and pragmatic literature, considering how these tried to establish societal norms and project a vision of what Spanish colonial society should be, and examine how this theoretical framework of empire fared against the practical reality, looking in particular at instances of conflict that arose through violence or legal means to reflect on their causes and resolution. I intend to do so within a comparative framework, alongside the experience of other peripheral areas, such as the New Kingdom of Granada, to reflect upon the freedoms that marginal and under-resourced territories enjoyed to experiment, and to assess how unique the Philippines really were within the Spanish Empire in this period. There has been a tendency to accept that the Philippines was particularly under-provisioned, but this has not been substantiated with comparison to other peripheral areas of the Spanish Empire, and so I believe that there is room for clarification. I also believe that various circumstances of Spanish colonialism in the Philippines can help reveal something more fundamental about the nature and characteristics of the Spanish Empire. For example, I think that it is worth reconsidering why mining and other economic activities that were so important in America failed to take off in the Philippines, watch the repeated Spanish military attempts, but often failures, to gain territory in other parts of island and mainland Asia signify, and whether a case can be made for entangled empires at this point of intersection between the Spanish and the Portuguese. Um, so I would like to thank you all very much for listening to my presentation, um, and I would ask you to please offer any criticisms, comments, advice, suggestions at all. Um, I'm very grateful. Thank you so much. interested in that. I mean, I think, unfortunately, it is something that, um, at the moment, I'm only sort of glimpsing yeah. through the chronicles themselves, but there are particular incidents where um, you have entire villages absconding and sort of priests writing back saying, look, they think that we eat people, yeah. and so they're not coming anywhere near us, and they're moving away, and I'm, I'm not sure yeah. how exactly, if it's possible to sort of yeah. move beyond these things. I don't know if sort of judicial proceedings, perhaps, if there were any, yeah. would indicate yeah. sorts of impressions. Yeah.
yeah, I've been very interested in that and also the intersection of uh, labour patterns that I suppose went into the construction, so obviously the, yeah, yeah. the sort of requisitioning labour, um, but that, and then how that tied into uh, existing patterns of labour within individual society, so labour owed to Adatu or to, to different officials and how they were able to make that work, and it seems like often there was a lot of contention about it. I think um, with the combat, there are a few things that have struck me. As I say, I've been working quite closely with scholars of the New Kingdom of Granada, which um, was also quite a peripheral area up in the um, northern Andes. Um, and a few things that struck me. First, it was when I was reading the classic uh, Felon's uh, Hispanization of the Philippines, and he was relating the figures for um, missionaries who were there in a certain period and talking about how vastly inferior they were to Mexico. But um, at a relatively similar period, they were actually much higher than they were in the New Kingdom of Granada, which was a much larger territory which sort of made me think that um, we need to look a little bit further. Also, in terms of the printing press, again, there was a very recent PhD thesis about uh, the, the, the presses uh, in Manila, and production was sort of measured again against uh, uh, Mexico, whereas there was a very sort of throwaway sentence about, oh, but it was still producing more, more books were produced in total than in Guatemala. So you sort of think that, well, there might be other places of comparison. Um, but I think language has really been one of the, things where I've been absolutely fascinated with, uh, particularly in the context of the New Kingdom of Granada, which was, I wonder if in some ways a little similar because there were many, many languages in sort of just a few valleys. I mean, it's a it's terrain that's very broken by very deep mountain valleys, and so there were lots of different languages, but there was a sort of a fiction that there was a general language um, uh, from the very beginning, and so people went in saying, right, there is one language and everyone is going to learn this, but of course, the exams that the priests had to take showed that a different language was set uh, for each area was maintaining this fiction that no, we're all speaking Moisca, uh, which of course is something that you, you didn't have in the Philippines. Um, and also just the different trajectory of how Spanish took off, I think uh, within a couple of centuries, I think looking at sen census records, most people sort of, lots of people did speak Spanish, lots of these local languages disappeared, and they identified themselves as just vecinos rather than anything else, which is quite a contrast um, with uh, Professor Rafael's work in later periods where there was this sort of active hostility towards teaching uh, Spanish to, by, by clerics who wanted to maintain their positions uh, to local populations. So I think you just have this very varied response across different parts of empires, depending on different officials, different circumstances, and a whole range, a whole host of consequences. But I think that by examining these a little bit more and by contrasting them and seeing why certain trajectories took root in some places and not in others, we can maybe develop a bit more of a concrete image of what exactly the Spanish enterprise is, because I think it's a very nebulous concept, and I think it's a lot more sort of, I think the legal treatise of how it works is a lot more sort of bluster and buffener, grafted onto the top of what was something quite chaotic and anarchic, and very much in the hand of, you know, individuals at, at, at various levels.
you so much. That's a lot of um, Sorry, no, lots of wonderful comments. Thank you. No, I'm writing everything down. That's brilliant. Um, I think the space one is very interesting, and I'm aware that throughout this entire talk, I've sort of been um, grossly falling afoul of sort of very sweeping generalizations. And I think the space thing is very important because I think there is a there has been a tendency in certain scholars in particular to talk about the Philippines in this very early period sort of in a very generalized way but then what you find is that they're sort of taking information from all sorts of different groups all sorts of different places and often across time so you get a very I think a full sort of impression so as you can probably tell I'm still in my first year so I'm, I'm full of optimism and wanting to do uh, everything um, but I'm no I'm very much aware that I think I imagine what will happen is I'll sort of start narrowing down and sort of focusing on a specific area or a few specific groups because I think that it is important to be specific about what you're talking about. Um, also, just because the, the space concept, I think, is very interesting because it, lots of it seems to be fluid space. You've got people traveling up and down and moving across and people moving across water and coming back and sort of, you know, large trading communities. You have family connections and all these other things. It's very fluid. Mm. I think um, the other thing I'd be very keen to do, if I could learn it, uh, would be to create some good maps because the terrain is obviously is absolutely fascinating. But there are lots of mountains, lots of islands, lots of you know points of where it's very difficult. Unless, you know, on, a, on these sort of plain flat maps that you quite often get, people can't get across and people can't make contact. But they sort of make better sense when you can see a map. And also, sort of the also the notion of the Spanish Empire as well. It's sort of we have a very 19th century conception that you just sort of colour the map in pink. And it's all fine, whereas really sort of thing, especially in this period, it was a, mu a much more nodal. I mean, you've got a few encomiendas and you have a few different things. And no, I think that that is absolutely essential to be very sensitive uh, to the fact that it's very easy to fall into sort of generalizations and make these sweeping assumptions. Um, on the second thing of in incommensurability, I'm sort of starting to think a little bit about that. I was, um, I think, because there's sort of been a bit of literature recently which has focused on uh, continuities or sort of grafting on and letting. Uh, structures continue um, but there's a lot of just points where I think th this was entirely alien you sort of have two very different cultures societies mindsets um, and ideas and when they meet they just d they don't quite work and so I'm wondering if you can I, I know it's a very sort of dangerous thing but if you can, if I can start understanding some of the factors that might have been at play for example and sort of um, sort of wolf, wolf, the, what, what we're told is frequent was sort of warfare between different groups. So sort of trying to understand the logics of why these were, why these were happening, because I think it might help also reveal why certain things happened with the Spanish. For example, the, the sort of patterns of slave raiding that were told sort of happened and just decimated the Visayas and um, on a relatively annual basis. Um, but then, of course, the Spanish would send expeditions every few years to Mindanao. And so you do almost wonder if this sort of reciprocity is actually regenerated, sort of unconscious to the Spanish, perhaps, but sort of fitting into or taking over what were ex existing patterns before, but sort of being slightly reformed. I'm not really sure this is all very vague, but I think it's I'm trying to think a little bit about the, the, the bigger picture and try and understand a little bit how it might have looked from, from both sides as well, as far as possible. I shall definitely take a look into that. Thank you. 
thank you so much. Yes. Wonderful, thank you. No, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in lay chronicles, I think, because um, the, the missionary chronicles get a lot of attention, because, in part because I think they have a lot of this data, whereas obviously Mordegat sort of appended to the, to, in, the final, in the final chapter. But I think that there's also um, a manuscript chronicle uh, in the Lily Library, which was written by what looks like a notary. Uh, I think I've been told, judging by the language, at the very end of the 16th century, so it's possibly one of the early ones and I think it's I think these are particularly important for sort of reframing like how sort of people the lived experience of the colonial society because when you're sort of so concentrated on these missionary sources it's all about sort of traveling and it's all about working with local people whereas I think the layman's experience was just quite different and that does sort of I think help put into perspective a little bit missionary activities a little so but no thank you the, the tip of looking at uh, the 19th century edition is, is brilliant thank you Well, thank you so much for listening attentively, and thank you so much for your comments um, and criticisms. These are really everyone. Um, my name is Adrian Carlo. Uh, I'm a recent master's graduate in SOAS, and uh, I plan to carry on further studies. Uh, and this is one of my um, re um, areas of research, which I've been I, I was handling when I was in SOAS. So, so this morning, uh, I'd like to talk about. Uh, the politics of language is performance. It's an examination of Rodrigo Duterte's populist politics. So there has been a recent explosion of the phenomenon defined as populism in many places in the world recently. In Europe, we have, of course, UKIP, Corbyn, um, in Greece, Syriza, in Spain, Podemos, Le Pen, Front National, Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. In North America, of course, the Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump phenomenon took place. In Southeast Asia, you can say that the recent um, triumph of Jokowi in Indonesia and further, um, further back, Taksin, Shinawatra, and Megawati, Sukarno Putri were all also a bit populist in the way they, they did their politics. But why do we call them populists, really? And are there populists versus non-populists? Is there clear definitions? Uh, what are the categories we, we should use to define if whether they're populist or non-populist? So what are the aims of my study? It is to better understand the nature and dynamics of populism in, in, in contemporary politics. It also aims to contribute to the growing literature on populism, which is still very much shaky, but it's growing. And it aims to investigate the role of language as a performative tool and, and style of representation, and also off offers a frame framework of analysis for future studies on population, populism. So to begin, um, what are the different ways in which populism can be conceptualized? Uh, how do we currently understand the phenomenon we call populism? Is it a form of discourse, uh, by, you know, like Laclau and Stavrakakis um, uh, said? Is it an ideology? Is it a political style? Recent um, articles by ben Benjamin Mopat um, looked at it as performative style and representation. 
um, is it, yeah, is it representation or is it uh, politics par excellence, as Mouf would say, is it, it's, it's the actual heart of politics where there is a division between people and the elite or the class. But uh, in studying it, I, I take the, the, the words of Laclau and to better understand populism, and in this case, there, there's populism. It is helpful to veer away from normative debates about the content of this politics and focus on form and how it is organized. So what are the main characteristics of populism? Um, one is it, it appeals to a certain notion of a people. It articulates it. it there's a, a concept of an othering of the elite. It might be the ruling class, it might be the, the corrupt politicians, the elite, so to speak. And there's always, it's always a response to a certain, cer certain type of crisis, like the war on drugs, or the corruption in the Philippines, criminality in the Philippines, in the Philippine context. So, but is there a clear definition of someone who's populist and not populist? Is it vertical in terms of people and the elite or horizontal? Are there gradations? This is levels of populism, 30% populist, 40% populist. It's hard to do the gradations. In, in the Philippine context, were there populists prior to Duterte? Of course, um, you can say Magdalesay was populist. Um, he opened Malacanang's House of the People. He, uh, he was first used jingles and used movies to pro pro promote his personality. Marcos was, in a sense, populist in his um, campaign as a war hero, a decorated war hero, although his medals were not really, um, um, they were they were true at all. So um, in Estrada as well, Era Para Sama Hirap, um, he, he created, his movie roles represented, was sort of a representation of, of, of the people. In local politics, you can see um, Muswari's creation of the Moro, the concept of the Moro from heterogeneity of, of um, uh, Islamic groups in the Philippines, in, in the now, he was able to generate a Moro people against the imperial Madal elite. In Arab, as, an, as a mayor, yes, he's a massa against elitista kind of phenomenon in terms of his local, local forays in San Juan, uh, the, the mayoralty where he comes from. And how about Duterte and Davao? Was he populist when he was in Davao? Well, he wasn't really a quintessential populist. He was, yeah, he was a trapo, traditional politician in Philippine political um, parlance. Uh, he was a local big man. He was in Seidel's world. He was, in Seidel, John Seidel's uh, words, he was a local boss or a man of prowess in Southeast Asian political parlance. He was a sign of political dynasty. He was part of an ar the anarchy of fa families, as McCoy would say, in the Philippines. So he was, he was part of that superstructure of, of powerful families in, in, the, in the local context. And also his rhetorical style, um, it, even if it received, it received a lot of response nationally, in, the, in, in Mindanao, it is the typical linguistic style of, of local sorties. What, what he's doing is actually found in any mayoralty or um, barangay uh, candidacy campaign uh, you can find in Agusan, in, in Davao, in Bukidnon. It, it is part and parcel of what they do. And he also, what happened with him is, um, the, um, compared to other other populists in the past, he didn't follow the typical route where from, from local government, executive branch, you carry on to become congressman, legislative, like senator, congressman, then vice president, and then some sort of higher post, and then, so, in a, in a, of course, create alliances along the way, and then have your, your presidential campaign and win. With him, um, from, from the president, uh, from, from, from Melody, he went straight to the presidency span of six months. So, and he wasn't even populist when he was there. He was just a local politician with, with typical brash, um, typical style, but then it's not really that much detached from how they do politics in, in Mindanao. So why was his political message um, easily transmitted in, from local to national? And what are the factors contributing to this meteoric rise? In a span of six months, he became from a mayor of the candidate, a mayor, a mayor to winning president. So uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to propose the idea of um, the politics of language through his Visayan politics as a, a key factor. So um, his language and uh, in his rhetoric uh, effectively frames his message, change is coming, it can be regime change, it can be the concept of giving power to the outsider, the peripheries, the forgotten. It is, form, it, it, is, it is through a political style, a form of representation of his identity as Visaya, as a, a political identity and, and also as a language. And of course, it's spoken in language and tone of Bisaya, the Bisaya people and how they do their language. So it's very much repre representative of that. So, oh, sorry. 
But how is this possible? How, what are the operative features? Um, well, Bisaya for Duterte is not just the language, but the character. It becomes a placeholder because it, it's such a immersive it, it is a wide-ranging character. There are caricatures of Bisaya in political parlance and in, 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 in the way in which Bisaya is used in popular culture that he can get from, he can, he can actually borrow from. And also, it's also because of Bisaya language position in the linguistic hierarchies in the Philippines, as well as its position in social and economic hierarchies. As a performative style, he uses his politics of language to add historical power to these demands of change. How? Because his language and rhetoric are very powerful in, 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 in pushing his agenda uh, in war, war on drugs. It also adds force to his indictment of criminals. It gives kind of sort of a legitimacy to his rebuke of corrupt politicians who control the levers of power. Uh, to, to further analyze this, we, we, we need to have a kind of a purview of the linguistic landscapes in the Philippines. There is a hierarchy of languages in the Philippines, but it is a heterogeneous um, um, space. And in that space, Visaya is the second uh, largest number of speakers. It has the second largest number of speakers. Visaya as a language actually is, um, it comes from Cebuano, uh, a place in, in the middle of the Philippines. And it's com it comes from the Cebuano language. And because of diaspora, it spread out throughout um, uh, Mindanao, as well as parts of Visaya, the Visayas Islands. So it, hence it, be, it got the, the, the name Visaya because it became a Visayan language, which was essentially Cebuano with attached uh, different vocabularies. Um, there are, concept, as I said, there are conceptions of Visayan Philippine society where uh, it's a language of the public channel, it's a, it's, you know, it's a Prongli language from the province. In Visayan jokes, as a trickster, it, it, it is, if you want to be a funny in in shows, in in conversations, if you if you uh, make it, uh, to, if you perform the Visaya language or the Visaya accent, it is a sort of a, a, a funny joke. Visaya komendai, Visaya komendong, those kinds of things are permeate. And sometimes the accent is a signifier for local, so a lower social class, lower social standing because of historical and material conditions. Um, it's yeah, it's a language of unsophistication and crudeness. It's fast cadence, it's hard tone, it's stiff vocal inflections, per perceives as unrefined. Even among Visaya speakers, like myself, I speak Visaya, but I also have a th fourth language, which is Budwana, which also has kind of, um, it, it has a dynamic that's also very much, um, very hard to deal with. Um, Visaya, among Visaya speakers in Mindanao, they use the term Visaya, which is a pejorative term. If you say Visaya, it's of a lower standing. Visaya na, something like that, so it's really, for, for, for you to, 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 to say that without batting an eyelash, it has a certain power to it that actually is inert and it's hard to explain. It needs to be, needs to be um, analyzed. And so in, in, the, in, in the context of, 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 of these conceptions of Bisaya, we look at the, 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 la, the, the concept of language of power in the Philippines, and I, I draw from the book of Ray Leto and, of course, Vince, in terms of how he illustrates the power of colonial language as weapons of domination. And it, it's historically, to historicize it um, through um, colonial language, and, uh, col the, the imposition of Spanish language and American language, it's very interesting. Um, and it's a reflection of relations of power in ideological, linguistic, and also social and economic. So the linguistic hierarchies, um, to explain, um, through, through colonialism, um, foreign languages were imposed to the Philippines, who as it, on its own had a dynamic of different languages to, to actually um, to, to deal with. So um, first, the Spanish in, uh, inhabited the apex because of, this, uh, of Spanish colonization when after the Americans came in and they, they instituted the system of education, they made American English the primary language and then Tagalog became the secondary language there was an even linguistic relationship that ensued between imposed languages and the local vernacular. When children learn their vernacular, they also, as they were learning the language, they're also learning imposed local languages. And that's, and like for, for those in Mindanao who have a third language, they're learning Putuanon, from, in, in my case, and then Bisaya, because it's spoken at school, and then Tagalog for movies, and then English, because we also study English. There is kind of a, a, a a, a war of translation, to borrow Vince's words, in that regard. 
And in terms of the whole infrastructure, um, the conception of Filipi Filipino, the Philippine revolutionaries, it was all um, within the hierarchy of power in, 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 in the linguistic landscape, wherein um, revolutionaries imagined the Filipino as an imagined community through a lot of Tagalog stories, through revolutionaries of the eight provinces in, 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 in Manila. So it was entirely steeped in, in colonial power struggles. And after, yeah, after, after colonialism, Tagalog replaced the, uh, the colonial language as the apex of the linguistic hierarchy. And uh, to combine this with economic hierarchies, Mindanao, in the case of Mindanao and Southern Philippines per se, it can be summed up by uh, a quote from Edgar Denman, Filipino economist. In the Mindanao case, this enigma is exacerbated by the effects of internal colonialism, the transfer of wealth from the southern regions to the nucleus of economic and political power in the north. So the Tagalog speakers in Manila maintained economic power. They were on top of the economic hierarchy, and this resulted in marginalization of Visaya as well as other speakers in the southern peripheries. Uh, the neo-colonial policies of the central government had disastrous neoliberal um, econ economic policies that actually decimated economies from the south, as Bell would, um, would argue, and also Hutchcroft and Cabello's uh, um, studies um, found out that the, the political economy of the Philippines has been plagued by material conditions of inequality from the onset, from, from the, the creation of the state through American colonization, and prior to that, through the friars and their, colonial, uh, their, their rice plantations in different parts of the country. Uh, in the southern island of Mindanao, for example, Duterte's home island, it only contributes to 80% of the GDP, despite having the most, the most natural resources. So there is an economic and a linguistic aspect that underpins the kind of Visaya character that he, he tries to play it, play it um, the character in, in terms of the strictly, in terms of the improvisation. So he links this in terms of performance. So it, he links um, the long historic antagonistic struggles against dominant Tagalog language. It lends power to his use of Visaya as a symbolic political tool. It also enables him to effectively articulate strong anti-establishment message because it's easy trend. It easily translates Visaya as a umbrella language, having being a lingo, sort of a lingua franca of, of its own in the southern part of the Philippines. It translates towards uh, in, if you are um, what I, if you are um, Manobo, you, if you are from Iligan, from Cagayan, from Tausug, if you speak Maguindanao, it is Visaya is easier to have. It's it's very familiar because it, it is part of your your umbrella of linguistic tools. And it's in terms of the fo formation of Visaya identity, Bisdak, Bisayang Tako, Bisayang Tako, it, it is very much prevalent in that area. And it also is very familiar in terms of how it plays out in the social social structure of the Philippine society, having, having, its, um, having its hierarchy, hierarchies as well that are entrenched and very much dynamic in its inter interrelation and interplay. So the disrupt, uh, what, what Duterte, Duterte's um, representation and his performance of, of, the, of, of this Visaya politics, this politics land, which is actually a dis disruption of the Gallic hegemony in national political discourse. And it possibly, it also has a, 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 a possibility to, to, to disrupt material and economic um, hierarchies to challenge the Gallic linguistic and material power, in a sense. What are the, what are the elements? Um, well, Visaya is a catchphrase, as I said. It's, a, it, 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 it's an easy tool to, to use to form a people because it is so wide ranging. I can be Visaya, from, someone from Davao could be Visaya, but then not really, it can be just a performative tool. So it's, it's part of the, 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 the repertoire of improvisation that, that, that Duterte de, deploys, actually. And of also, the Duterte's the, the Visaya is an unsanitary, Unsanitized, rough version of Visaya. It's not the the statesman Visaya that some some Visaya politicians would use. It is the, the underbelly. It is the gutter. So it is very much a subaltern language that he he tries to put forward. And it, in doing so, it rearranges some some sort of hierarchy in terms of the linguistic powers, power structure. Because instead of English and then Tagalog, he actually code switches wherein he he. Speaks in perfect English using, you know, his his, his capabilities as a prosecutor and attorney when he was young, and then afterwards, when he switches to Visaya, he goes straight and goes to the terse Acerbic Visaya that he usually employs in his speeches. So, 
It's a, it is a it is a code switch that has um, power uh, symbol, uh, symbol, symbolic significance. Um, the the, unfil the unfiltering words it bears the identity of the masses through performance. It translates to the language of the downtrodden, downtrodden through what the clown move would, would cause chains of equivalence. Chains of equivalence meaning the chains are linked together in their shared antagonism materially in terms of economics, social standing, and linguistically in terms of how they, they converse and what, what, what sort of oppressions they get in, in society in terms of being Visaya or Visaya as a placeholder of being Waray, being Butuanon, being Dabawenyo, being Taosog, having to do with these hierarchies. So it, it, it can be an empty signifier. It is a placeholder for a multitude of meanings. So it links together a lot of things and it, it becomes a very powerful tool. And it's not even a strategic, it, it just, in terms of how it plays out specifically in the Philippines, it's not in an overall strategy for Duterte. He has, he has his own, but then because of how it plays out and how he is Bisaya and how Bisaya uh, played out in the hierarchy of, of eco economics and the hierarchy of language, it, it lends powerful force where in, in six months it actually translated right away, even in Tondo, even in, in, in the northern part of the country. It's hard to consider, it, 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 it requires much more research, but there is some sort of transference that happens right away. And it's very, it's, it, in that regard, it's very much uh, uncommon how, how it, he grows right away in that regard. So there, there are tactics to it, bad manners, of course, and as Vince mentioned, canto boy tactic, man of the street. Um, he always, when he was um, doing his sorties, he always sits down with, with the back end of the chair, in front of the gate with his, with his um, white towel and he always reenacts, you know, canto boy you know, humor and canto boy kind of behavior. And also, you know, there's fouls in the air language. And um, these kinds of things create sort of uh, a force in terms of giving, giving more power to how he, how he forces his agenda in terms of the drug problem, in terms of forcing criminals to, to prosecution in terms of handling corrupt Hawaii officials. So it, it is it is part of the parlance of the tools that the repertoire was that he creates for, for 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 his agenda in a sense. So in to, to sum it up, the, there are discursive elements of his beside politics. It constructs the people, the challenge of Tagalog El hegemony. It's, it has symbolic power, it symbolizes, it represents disenfranchised vernacular speakers in the peripheries. It enables him to other. Uh, it enables him to um, make a coherent and, and, and a, um, establish a coherence as a, as a politi political force from an otherwise heterogeneous group of, of, of people and, and ideas and claims through chains of equivalence and as well empty signifiers. Uh, the idea of code switching, the the, the strategy of code switching, um, presents uh, uh, a. a a way to destabilize linguistic as well as material um, hierarchies in the Philippines, in the Philippine polit political discourse. So, um, yeah, um, in essence, um, what I'm trying to, to, to do in my research is um, try to understand the ways in which language shows, uh, language and how it's performed and how it's conceptualized and historicizing it and theorizing it as well helps us understand uh, populism in its many shapes and forms because there are many content, there are many types of content within populist strategies, but we need to understand the form of it and how it operates in different different timelines, different um, political economies, different histories. Um, it, yeah, it, show, it's, uh, it shows the specificity, specificities of how populism, populism operates in varying social conditions and how it triggers this concept of conflation um, because it's, it's a re representative in nature it is a performative tool. How the idea of conflation um, happens in different in different areas, in different contexts. In the Philippine case, it is conflation of material and linguistic hierarchies, which just so happens is is what what the history of the Philippines or Mindanao tells us. But, but what happened? What what? How how does the idea of conflation um, take place in different um, areas of the world, and how is it used as a tool? So it can be a good a framework for analysis. Yeah, uh, it introduces new methods of ana analyzing Duterte's populism and populism in general. As, as Vince would say, um, in the Philippines, they always 
go the normative route, they always um, portray him as, as, you know, as a criminal, as killer, as, as anti-humanized, which is all, it's, it, 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 it's true and it's very, it's very much um, a sad reality, but in terms of him not giving a, a fuck and him um, conti continuing with his agenda. Anyway, it, this is a different way of analyzing it. What are, they what are the dynamics that make him so powerful? makes his message so prevalent. And so with many, with populism taking many forms in incarnation, other there is societal politics, this is how language affects your process with your conditions, and yeah. So that's my conclusion, and yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'd be glad to, to ask, uh, to, to get questions, because I'm, I'm trying to build this for, for you know, further research and maybe do a, a, a research uh, a project in the future that can, I can go do a few with. So yeah, thank you for your time. It's, it's, uh, it's, I've been thinking about it because uh, my area of research is comparative politics, but looking at the literature, looking at how, how they do it, how the methods of comparison, there are different levels. As I told you, time, space, in terms of ideology, in terms of, and it's hard, I mean, even to think about Duterte, for example, the easiest comparison would be like some, someone like Trump, it's very hard. It's easy surface comparison, but it's totally different. Uh, in Southeast Asia alone, Taksin Sunuwat and his um, yellow shirts and, and blue shirts, um, there are easy comparisons of red and blue, the colors, but then if you look at the political economy, you, you historicize it, and you look at the theoretical frameworks by which they uh, assess his form of populism, it's, it's, uh, at this point, it's very ambitious, but I would like to eventually, when I do field work, because this was a master's thesis, and I haven't done research of field work yet, so I, what I envision is go, since being a Visayas speaker and a speaker of other languages in Mindanao, I could, Pretty much pick apart. Um, I discuss this with uh, some other colleagues to, to really look at how language plays and how it that that form of analysis can contribute eventually to the wider um, literature, not just of comparative politics, but with populism as well. It, it is very the definitions are very thin now. There are different areas, there are different strands. They say it's discourse. They say it's strat political strategy. They say it's just subterfuge. It's really so to create a a discourse. Create some sort of um, literature that we can base on. Um, I think this would be a good, good contribution to that. Yeah, um, that's that, that's also that was a very for me looking at his speeches and comparing it because I've 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 also had firsthand experience with how leaders such as himself in the Philippines in Mindanao do their campaign speeches, and there is always an, an element of masculinity, an element of being bugoy, being kalo, being whatever it is they call um, like a boyish boyish behavior to appeal to. A stage, but then as 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 performance and representation, it's two ways in a sense where there is a performer, but then the audience itself themselves, there are different types of receptions, and it's hard to like. I haven't studied him doing his sorties in Davao, but I've 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 witnessed certain other uh, um, campaigns nearby, but. Of course, in Davao, it's different. It's a different history, and the composition of people is, in Davao is different. They, it's more of a heterogeneous society in Davao, actually, because it is a, a, an area of 
diaspora, whereas in other areas of Mindanao, we have ethnic communities establishing first and then creating an infrastructure, a state structure afterwards, after colonization. So it's hard, but then you can see, you can see a lot of um, the vocal inflections and the style by which he performs these, these, these codes. Um, it is very much canto boy politics, um, uh, um, not canto, boy, canto boy rhetoric, humor, which also gives him yeah, a lot of yeah, significance and meaning. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, it, at this point, it's hard to, to, to delineate it at, the, at this point because yeah, I haven't done the research. It's, it's early on, and it, I don't even have the, 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 the clear methodology because you can do it in a micro level, you can do it in a macro level. But I, I, I'm leaning towards doing it on a micro level in a specific, specific area in the Philippines, in Mindanao, but uh, it's still under discussion. Yeah, it's a very, very good question because I've been thinking about it for a long time because when you look at the surveys, it's not a specific class. His support is actually all levels. It's class A, class B, class C. And part of it you can say, you know, it is, it is, the, it, it is the underlying um, relations of power in the Philippines that's deeply entrenched and they will just shift whatever the power, whoever is in power, it will shift, alliances will shift. It is a contestation, an interplay of inter-elite contestation to, to, to say, to, to, to borrow parlance. So it is that level where, you know, from, from La Casa NUC it became um, Liberal Party and then now it's back, to, but it's essentially the same political families and it's the same elite in Manila, it's the same financiers, the same bankers. So um, they will always, if you look at it in a kind of a um, materialist um, frame, they will always, you know, look to serve their, what, what, what's good for the interest, so whoever's in power, you will, you will, their, their, their agenda will easily be, become very much accepted if they're in power. Th that's a, you know, but that's a, a, a very easy way to compare it. But in terms of, I'm still looking at the notion of transference and, 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 and conflation, representation, that idea, it's very much um, what I'm thinking about, but it's hard to theorize that and also historicize that as well, because there are different, different languages in the Philippines, they're attached to different histories and how they react. I mean, I have personal experience, but it is contextualized within Mindanao. But uh, Philippines as a whole, it's a, it's a group of um, multi multilingual speakers, so they have different, different experiences. But the level of transference would, ha would have to, to be due to certain material conditions, relations to power, the history of it, but how, how it comes to be or how it, it, it appears will depend on, on the contextualization. But there, there is some sort of transference and it has something to do with Bisaya as also, also as a placeholder. It can be, it can, it can represent other subalterns or other oppressed because of the way in which it, it was it in itself a small a, a kind of an, a mirroring also of, of Tagalog in terms of how it transferred. But the way it transferred to, the, to Visayas is totally different. It's because of the diaspora, because of the spread. It's not through colonial domination and through strategies of colonial power. But so, so there are a lot of like factors to determine. And you know, all, all I can do is just ask questions and maybe ask more questions afterwards. It's, it, it, you can build on these kinds of, of, of discourses. But uh, it, is, it is a very good question. And it, there are a lot of factors to, to consider. Yeah, that's also because uh, when when I when I looked at the secondary education and all that, um, I looked up. Well, that, well, I studied that in terms of his code switching and how um, the underlying rela relationship between English and Filipino and then Visaya for him, um, because 
in the Philippines, English is still the, the, the symbol of like prestige. If you are an uh, eloquent English speaker, it's much better than if you're eloquent in Tagalog. Or it, but, it, you know, but in terms of the hierarchy, it's that level of prestige, English. And then in terms of his code switching, I guess, when he, he tries to symbolize the fact that you know, he is a good English speaker, but he doesn't need Tagalog to actually establish um, control over um, political discourse because his Bisaya, which he reintroduces, like it, it creates some sort of disruption. Uh, but also, if you look at it in terms of how Bisaya see themselves in amidst of amidst of uh, this, these hierarchies, it's also a reassertion. So, so it is a, a, a very integral part in terms of how English and Tagalog were dominant and then it will tell the story of how Bisaya and as a placeholder for other vernacular speakers, it is a form of disruption in terms of how they can re re probably reassert some sort of dominance. Yeah. Could, could be on the and uses the Tagalog? Yes, actually, because... Um, yeah, yeah, but Okay, that's it. textual examples. I mean, if you just produced a speech that you, you know, a, a particular speech and looked at it, and you know, what's really surprising about Duterte is that, I mean, I agree that the, the way in which his emergence is sort of um, uh, given new prominence to Messiah, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, for the most part, when he's speaking in Manila or surrounding provinces, he shifts between English and Tagalog, right? And, and Messiah will come in once in a while. Yeah. But he really limits his Messiah speeches. Mm -hmm. When he's talking to Messiah, that's the, that's the oddest part. It, yeah, that, it, there it, is that. It never, I mean, contrary to your claim, Messiah never becomes disruptive enough to sort of upset the linguistic hierarchy. You could argue exactly the opposite, which is what the third is doing is actually reinforcing the linguistic hierarchy. Yeah, you know? that's Where interesting. Yeah. is privileged, Tagalog is second, mm -hmm. Messiah continues to be third. And he just used, right. it, used Messiah as, right. yeah, it, as, right. as a starting point, but then it still, when, when he starts, it still reproduces the same right. hierarchy. Right, but when he speaks to the Messiah, It's but, but what that also means is that Bisaya ends up becoming re-provincialized. Right? That's also it a good never point. Breaks out of that sort of provincial yeah. nomenclature. Yeah. Um, so I mean, in some ways, you know, my guess is, from my opinion anyway, is that you have to seriously rethink every yeah. single bit of your argument. Here. It's yeah. It's it's yeah. it's something that I. It's that's why it's ongoing in a sense because when I was when I started, it was during campaign period, and it's it was sort of a critical juncture where. In a, uh, a limited amount of time, such a thing happened. Yeah. But in terms of building from it, in term, I've also considered other because it's a, it's in terms of a political phenomenon. It's very much af after taking power, of course, strategies change, and then once populist rhetoric um, is combined with state power and military power, it, it, it will always change. So, I've. That's why it's. So it might be good to start with yeah. So, yeah. I, It is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it forces you to sort of think about it in a particular way. But if, 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 you, if you read the text from the ground up, then using the term populism becomes entirely unnecessary. Yes. It's, I mean, it's such a cliche. You know. I, I, I understand yeah. the, 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 the points entirely because even when you talk about populism among, yeah. among people who discuss it, it is yeah. quite a, a thin level of, 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 of Categorizing right. political phenomenon, and what I was trying to do is just to frame it and then try to explain it yeah. in that general yeah. term. But it's what I would suggest is that instead of using populism, you inquire about the meaning of the popular. What is the popular? What constitutes the popular? Exactly. Right? There are many, many studies about. We see Omar talks about mm -hmm. popular preeminence, for yeah. example. Now that would be a way, for example, begin to interrogate what is what what is it that makes something popular? Yeah. Exactly. What is the word for popular? It's a, it's a, it's an English term actually. It's a, it's a, yeah. So so it's 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 hard. Yeah. So it's it's a hard to, it's it's a very yeah. It's a it's a very um, problematic term, populism. Um, but then again, it, well, even the popular. Yeah. Even the, the popular. The fact that the, the, the term is in English 
mm -hmm. suggests that uh, the only way to, to conceptualize the Visaya is in terms of other things. Yes. So, I have, so, so the very notion of a popular, which is supposed to relate to the people themselves, yeah. is an alien notion. <laughs> right? it, uh, it, it uses, it's a different, yeah, it, this, there's a different underlying re relationship in, in, in the, in the, in the local that's not doesn't it doesn't even begin to to capture like notions of popular from our, our part yeah it's 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 very it's it's a good yeah it's a good way to reassess this kind because as someone doing comparative politics um, I've been wanting to do more anthropological to carry the anthropological you know um, methods into um, Understanding political phenomena, which uh, which yeah, is uh, especially in Southeast Asia, is con contextualized and it's specific and it's really based on what the conditions are in the on the ground. So, framing populism seems like a very um, a, a there, there is a disconnect in a sense, but at the same time, it's a mode of um, creating methods of comparison. You you would say that it, it is kind of um, so that might be a good start. Yeah. It's, yeah, because. Yeah. It, yeah. As, as a. Popular, yeah. Okay. That's a good, yeah, that's a good suggestion because that will reassess different conceptions of what popular is. And, yeah. No, 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 not conceptions, but uh, processes. Processes of popular. Because a popular is a historical process, right? Yeah. So you can get away from this idea of conception, mm -hmm. of notion. Yeah, actually, that's. that's into yeah. historical. Actually, yeah. And they're quite proud of it. Yeah. Right? So how do you deal with the Visayan people who don't? Exactly. Right? So that, that's also that's also a very I mean that's that's a more interesting I mean, yeah. And the role of elites. The role of yeah, the role of elites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't when they when they when they go to University of Manila, they're fluent in English, but then they don't speak the Gaul because they speak straight Visayan. So that's that's a notion of like privilege, notion of class, different different Visaya identities in terms of how they are, where they are in the economic structure, also um, adapt differently in, in in this kind of linguistic structure. So it, it's very it's a yeah, there there are a lot of areas to really think about. Yeah, yeah. Because none of this really makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, um, good, good morning, uh, good afternoon, it's already past noon. Um, so I'm Rowena uh, Palacios and I'm a, a second year PhD student at the Institute of Education, which is right across the street. Um, and I'm doing my PhD in philosophy of education. Um, I'm actually looking at um, the work of Hannah Arendt, who's a, hey, that's right, Just come in. Um, I'm actually looking at the work of Hannah Arendt, who's a um, 20th century German Jewish um, political thinker. And I'm trying to draw from her thought um, a kind of philosophy of education uh, based on the very few essays that she wrote about schools, uh, but also in the context of schools um, and the larger political community. Um, but what I'm going to present today is one small section of one chapter um, of that much larger project. And it's the chapter where I'm actually engaging with Professor Rafael's work, as well as the work of other um, post-colonial and decolonial Philippine thinkers who've written about education. Um, so what I intend to do with this chapter, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback because this is not my area of specialization, but what I I'm, what I'm intend to do with this chapter is to bring Aaron's ideas on education into dialogue with the Philippine post-colonial and decolonial discourse about education from the 1950s to the 2000s. So some of you are already familiar with those debates. Uh, for those of you that aren't, I'll just give a very, very brief um, introduction. So a lot of the debates about education in the Philippines have been about medium of instruction and language. Um, so from the time when um, the, the current 
educational system is really um, is something that developed from the public educational system, which was um, created by the American colonial government, um, during which English was the main, main medium of instruction. And then over the decades, there was some debate about whether it should be Filipino, whether it should be mother tongue languages. In terms of policy, this actually led to um, a back and forth policy of switching from English to bilingualism, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, um, the current policy is that um, the medium of instruction in the first three years is your mother tongue, which could be one of the 100 and so and so languages in the Philippines, supposedly, but in practice, I think only actually, they actually only have, I think, 12 uh, mother tongue languages, which are currently, um, which currently actually have instructional materials. Um, and then after the third year of primary school, that's when uh, people start shifting gradually to English and Filipino as the medium of instruction. So because of the in, because of the short time that we have for this symposium, what I'm going to present today is really just my proposed theoretical framework for analyzing um, the discourse about education. And it's a framework that I... Um, okay, that's in the title, um, that um, I'm proposing, and I hope you can give me feedback as to whether you think it's a good idea or not, but I'm trying to create a kind of tripartite distinction among language adoption as er wherein language is used as ergon, energia, and as play. Um, so my goal here is to try to use these um, concepts to categorize and analyze the pre presuppositions in the in the debate. So when, when you have, for example, Renato Constantino, for example, writing about, um, about why um, we shouldn't have English as a medium of instruction, what are his presuppositions that, he's, that he holds about what language is and what the purpose of language is? So I came across um, language as ergon and, and language as energia um, in the context of reading about Hannah Arendt because of the book by Barbara Cassin, um, who's a French um, philosopher who recently, in 2014, published the, the French book, Nostalgia, When Are We Ever at Home? It was translated into English in 2014. And this dichotomy is actually a dichotomy which, if I'm not mistaken, originally comes from um, Wilhelm um, von Humboldt, I don't know how to pronounce his name, <laughs> okay. um, but she uses it in a slightly different way. Um, and even though her appropriation of this idea is something which she doesn't really develop in great detail, you can kind of um, draw out from the way that she engages with Aaron's texts what she means by this. And um, in her vocabulary, language as ergon seems to refer to... Um, Okay, language seen as a kind of externally imposed static totality. So something that you have to learn, the rules of which you have to learn, so that you can use that language. Um, so from the very word ergon, which means function in ancient Greek philosophy, uh, the emphasis here is on a very instrumental view of language. Um, on the other hand, um, Kassan talks about language energia, which is language when we are putting it into work. So language where you already have enough mastery of it in order to be able to use it creatively. And she uses this distinction to try to answer the question, what does it mean to have a mother tongue? Okay. So in the person of Hannah Arendt, who was a polyglot, so she, her, Arendt's original language is German, um, but then she moved to Paris um, um, in the 1930s because of, well, what was happening in Europe, and then she fled to um, the United States during the war, and she was a refugee in the United States until she was naturalized in the 1950s. Um, Arendt um, originally was writing in German, and then for almost a decade had to write in French and speak in French. And then in the United States, she was writing and working in English. Uh, but in an interview, in a very famous interview, um, in, in the 1960s with the German journalist um, Gunther Gauss, she was asked, so um, what do you think of Germany? Do you still consider it your homeland? And she goes, no, it's not my homeland. Um, but what remains, she says, the language remains. And she begins to talk about how her mother, her homeland is the German language. And so um, analyzing this interview, Kassan tries to uh, make sense of what Arendt meant by that and what does it mean to identify your homeland 
with a language, right? What does it mean that you are at home when you are speaking a language? And her, Kassan's um, proposal is that it has to do with the mastery of the language, so that if you master a language so well that you can be creative in that language. You can actually create new ideas in that language, such as Aaron did. She would think in German, but then write in English. Um, then that is your mother tongue. Okay. Um, so I came across Barbara Kassan's um, ideas, and I thought it was quite interesting, but I also felt like it didn't really resonate with what my own experience of multilingualism, um, where I do all of my academic work in English, but emotionally, I feel most connected to the Tagalog language. And so I began to wonder whether that was really, wh whether there was re that was really all there was to it, to trying to identify what a mother tongue was. And it was actually um, Vince Raphael's essay, I think originally published in Critica Cultura, which eventually became part of Motherless Tongues, um, where I found, um, I think, an answer which resonated a lot more with my own experience. And this was um, his essay where he talks about language as play. Um, so I was really struck, and I'll quote you, uh, Professor Raphael, um, with uh, this paragraph wherein um, Vince describes what it must be, f what it must have been for a Filipino pupil to go to school during the American colonial period, where he was banned from speaking in in his vernacular, and he had to learn English and learn subjects in English. And um, so Raphael, well, Vince says, coming to school meant leaving the home, stepping into a foreign space dominated by the other speech. One left one's mother and mother tongue to stand before a foreign language. One was exposed to the specific exacting demands of the foreign for several hours a day, forced to conform one's body and voice to its commands and expectations. Submission to the rigors of English, however, was deemed a way of eventually mastering it. Confronting the other speech, one was trained to conquer it, to possess it and make it an, an integral part of oneself. So I thought that this very... Um, uh, uh, picturesquely described um, language as ergon, so something that whose rules are imposed upon you and which you have to, um, which you now have to master so that you can master the language. But after this description, Vince now presents a counter narrative, which he, which is inspired um, by Nick Joaquin's 1963 essay, The Language of the Streets, which analyzes Tagalog slang and. Um, Tagalog slang, for those of you who aren't Tagalog speakers, it draws heavily from colonial vocabulary. So there are a lot of, um, at the time, more Spanish words, now a lot of English loan words. And Joaquin calls it a language that is, and I'm quoting Nick Joaquin here, created by the masses out in the open to express their lives, to express their, their times, and just for the fun of it. And this was the sentence that struck me. That's why it promises to be a great language, because it's being created for the sheer joy of creating. Happy, happy lang. Okay, so um, in the essay, in Vince's essay, he cites long passages from Hawkins from Hawkins' essay, which are peppered humorously with Tagalog slang derived from English words. So Vince's analysis of Nick Hawkins' essay is that it challenges the hegemony of languages. So English is no longer this imperial language that has the power to banish the vernacular to the shadows, but here there's more parity between the languages. So Tagalog speakers actually demonstrate their appreciation of the sound of the English language. Um, Tagalog speakers liberally borrow from it, play with it, transform the meanings of English words, and then incorporate them into the vernacular. So just as a quick anecdote, my younger brother uh, was born and raised in the United States, and he always gets a kick out of how English words are transformed into Tagalog slang. And the one that he loves the most because he finds it the silliest is when in Filipinos say game na, which means let's go, <laughs> right? And he finds it so interesting why game suddenly means go or let's do it. Okay? And every time I say it, he just starts laughing. Okay? But I mean, we all have that, all of us who, are, who speak um, Tagalog have that experience of Tagalog and English really being friends, so that there's there's no um, how would I say strict delineation any longer between Tagalog and English, and you liberally borrow from um, English in a way that becomes almost unthinking. You aren't even conscious of it. So 
what I felt was that Vince's account of how a foreign language in this particular case is adopted and then adapted by a colonized people fills fill the gap in Kassan's work. Um, although Kassan does acknowledge the inventiveness of language, and she alludes to the ways in which individuals are able to reimagine meanings of individual foreign words, thus producing new meanings. However, both language as ergon and language as energia presume that language must be associated with work. Okay, so energia actually has, um, energia and ergon, the two words actually have uh, the same root, um, which has to do, which connotes work. Um, either the work of learning and using the language or the work of using language to produce new ideas. Moreover, Kassan's account still assumes that the boundaries between languages are largely fixed. There's a sentence where Kassan describes um, I don't have the exact quote here, but she speaks of how a person must be able to speak at least two languages to know that he or she is speaking one. So at no point does she question the boundary between languages that define one as distinct from another. Therefore, I think that Raphael's presentation of Joaquin's analysis of slang introduces a third way to conceptualize language adoption, language as play. Raphael goes beyond Kassan's idea that language can be used creatively. For Joaquin and Raphael, language itself is the object of creativity. Language itself is not bound strictly by norms of correctness. So fluid is it that even the borders between language become permeable. An English word spills into the Tagalog lexicon, its original meaning challenged and changed, its original grammatical rules broken down in favor of the grammatical rules of a new language. Um, I was struck specifically by this idea that um, uh, in Joaquin's essay that um, slang, uh, the Tagalog slang is created not just for self-expression but also for the sheer joy of creating it as well. And my intention is to relate this to Arendt's own tripartite distinction um, among labor, work, and action. So Hannah Arendt, in her book Human Condition, writes about three human activities. Um, labor, which is primarily econom the economic work that you do for biological survival, work, which is the work that you do to create um, concrete objects and action, which is the human activity that takes place among humans. Um, now action, um, although speech can be a part of all of those three activities, um, speech has a special kinship with action. Action has does not necessarily have any concrete output. You may have directed goals, you may direct your action towards goals, but th there's no guarantee that you will actually achieve those goals. And action is limitless, it's infinite. Um, the effects of action um, are like ripples in a, you know, when you throw a pebble in a pond, you can never know when the effects end. And so this, this image of, of speech, slang speech specifically, as being this non-instrumental play of words, um, I think there seems to be some kind of um, parallel with Arendt's understanding of speech in the context of action, which I'm hoping to explore further. So what I'm intending to do now with this tripartite distinction is to kind of look at um, these debates through the um, in, in the past 60 years about language um, and the medium of instruction in Philippine education and use this as a kind of um, theoretical framework to understand what some of the presumptions that many of these um, writers were making. So in language instruction, as we all know, when you're learning a foreign language, the initial way that you're taught that language is really you have to follow the rules. So much so that in many Filipino schools um, until today, you are not allowed to speak in the vernacular or you are fined if you speak in the vernacular. I don't know if any of the people who went to primary school in the Filipinos. Yes, um, yes, yes. You have to pay 25 centavos in some schools, not, not a lot. So it's, it's awful, right? So language as ergon really becomes this totality, right? This, this, this totality with its own rules, this very foreign totality, which is forced upon you. And then, of course, you graduate to learning how to write, learning creative writing, and then language becomes energia, where language now becomes the way that you communicate your ideas. But at no point, at least in the basic education system, is language actually encouraged as play. And I think that it's actually in, um, well, specifically the discipline of philosophy that I'm most familiar with, where this idea of language as play has emerged. So um, in the history of um, Filipino philosophy, um, ever since, well, Father Roque Ferriol's in the 1960s, um, 
began to do philosophy in Tagalog and then actively created his own vocabularies and tried to use different Filipino words to express certain philosophical ideas. This kind of creativity about language and see, seeing language as something that you can actually create and continually create um, that now has led to similar movements being done in other Philippine languages as well, still in the field of philosophy. So now you have um, uh, Ilocano philosophy movement, um, you have like a, a Bicolano philosophy movement, but all of them still are, are hinged upon this idea that in order to do philosophy in our vernacular, it involves this linguistic creativity, this playfulness with language. Um, and so that's kind of where uh, my thoughts are now. I, they're still a little bit unformed, and so I'm looking forward to hearing your comments, questions, or feedback about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I haven't thought about that in a very disciplined way, but my impression just from stock knowledge is that they don't actually have a lot, as much power as they think they do. I mean, you know, the Commission on Weekend Filipino, I remember when there was this attempt to change the orthography, to change the spelling of Filipino words in order to use the letter J more and the letter Q more, and no, it did not take off at all. So um, I'm, I don't know how how effective they actually are in terms of implementing their policies because I think, you know, language is always used. I, I think there's more power in the way that language is actually used rather than in whatever policies that they create. But again, that's a very undisciplined, non-academic um, opinion. So I might be completely wrong. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, the, the thick UP one, right? Yeah. Yeah.
exactly. Yeah. 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 That, that question carries so much baggage. <laughs> I mean, but everybody code switches, right? I mean, you, we speak differently in an academic setting than you know we would in um, you know when we're with our friends. Um, and I think that you know teaching children that this is the code, for example, if you're applying for a job, or this is the code in you know an academic setting, doesn't preclude the fact a kind of openness to recognizing also that you also do have codes much more informal codes and I think that maybe the problem might be banishing some codes and only allowing others where as maybe a more playful approach to not just language instruction but accepting you know different mediums of instruction within a school setting would be more open to the many different ways that people speak and of course this also is related to the mother tongue question uh, because part of the um, Part of the debates about language has kind of been, you know, uh, uh, originally a view that English was colonial, and then eventually a view that um, Tagalog is colonial. Um, and yet, I think a more playful approach would be a more open approach, you know, a, an approach which recognizes um, not just, um, you know, that you can imagine a kind of parity of languages. Okay, maybe it's a fiction, but but. You, kind of artificially imagine a parity of languages where, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, 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 that's yeah, yeah, that's, you that's mean, right, yeah. It's just, just like the French languages emerge, yeah. you just assume the whole language yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so thanks for that, it's really enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, so I'm obsessed about the idea of Ergon, with the Peragon. So I was wondering if Cassette Thank you. No, Kassan doesn't talk about that. And thank you for, for bringing that up. And I'll definitely um, look at that a little bit more. Yeah, it might be really helpful. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I hadn't thought about it. Thank you for that. I hadn't thought about 
kind of like the sociology of of teaching and 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 you know rules like having to pay a fine every time you speak English. But that's really helpful. I'll, I think I, I will think about it a little bit more. I want. I don't know how much of it will actually go into the thesis, but I'll definitely think about that. Thank you. The thought occurred to me, but I didn't pursue it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, but yeah, I, actually, when Nick Joaquin's essay, he does talk about spoken language, and he specifies that he's talking about spoken language. Um, but and and I do wonder because the example that I gave, for example, in Filipino philosophy, where there is a much more playful approach to language, that is actually written. I mean, these were written in books. Um, yeah, no, I haven't really thought about that, but definitely that's something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And I don't know if this is, I, I don't know if this is, if there's any empirical basis for this, but this is my own experience when I write in Filipino. I tend to write the way that I speak, much more than in English, where writing is a lot more artificial. I don't know whether you, this is just me, but I do feel like when I'm writing in English, it's a lot more artificial and I'm writing in, a, in an almost, you know, different register. But when I'm writing an essay in Filipino, it's really how I speak. That's, I don't know if it's just my own experience. Um, one last for BJ. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just, just a thought. Um, um, the connection between the languages play and the languages improvisation in a sense that, um, in fact, the, the, the notion of standardizing it is actually distancing itself from the speech. That's to say, the, the actual practice, the, the, yeah. the, the yeah. relation to the ground that actually yeah. are more concrete um, you know, evidence of how it's been used. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes. So it's not just vocabulary, even the grammar. Yes. So it's always in, in undergoing a, a, a continuous form of improvisation. Yes. And then I wonder what the relationship is with that in the form of authority in a particular yeah. sense. I mean, it's if you standardize it, it kind of defeats the purpose in a sense because language is always in, in different forms, in many, yeah. in many areas of the world. And there are a lot of um, these instances where it's always improving. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I don't have an answer to that, but definitely, um, I do think that the play doesn't just come in the vocabulary and in loan words per se, but even in the way that you use the words and in you know the the, the grammatical structures that you, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Hello, I'm Chase. So I'm currently not a PhD student. I'm a master's student at the University of Oxford studying global and imperial history. So today I'd like to talk about my um, dissertation, which is almost due, so hopefully it won't be terrible, but we'll see what happens. So today I'll be talking about one man, Manuel Godinho de Heredia, who was born approximately 1558 in Malacca, in Portuguese Malacca, and died in 1623 in Portuguese Goa. So Sanjay Subramaniam described him as one of the most, one of the oddest personages in the Portuguese empire. And I think this is very true because Aredio was a kind of person who crossed many types of boundaries, cultural, geographic, and racial as well. He was a mestizo. So his father was a Portuguese soldier and his mother was a woman from the island of Sulawesi in the Malay archipelago. She was either Bugis or Malay, we don't know. Um, he was educated at an early age in the Jesuit, with the Jesuit missionaries in his home city of Malacca. Um, and at the age of 13, he traveled to Goa, where he also enrolled in the Jesuit seminary. He trained here for about 10 years and was steeped in the classics of Western education. So philosophy, language, science, mathematics. So this was a very big impact on his life. However, after 10 years of training, he did not become a missionary for many. We don't know exactly why, but he left. And he dedicated the remainder of his life to the drafting, but not publication, and circulation of a variety of historical geographical treatises about the lands in which he had lived. So especially the Malay archipelago, and especially India. So 
Aredia has Aredia kind of went under the radar for several centuries, but he was rediscovered in the 19th century when he became entangled in a very Eurocentric debate of the time, which was who were the first Europeans to discover Australia, because this appeared in many of his works. Um, more recent scholars have argued this is reductive, of course, as it kind of pigeonholes his work into categories of accuracy and inaccuracy. Um, he was also involved in a second strain of historiography, which kind of really seized upon his status of being a mestizo and really reified his indigeneity without more critically thinking about how as a go-between he may have perhaps fabricated knowledge or how he may have used his mestizaje as a kind of tool and also mitigated it as a liability. So it wasn't just a default position. So I think that more recent literature has also critiqued this position. And already is now studied as a complex producer of knowledge, very emblematic of this period in which the Portuguese empire is just about to begin its era of decline, in which the crown is still collecting information on its overseas territories, but in which it's very reluctant to actually expand and perhaps conquer more. So I think he's very emblematic of this moment. So my dissertation is thinking about how I can build upon these recent trends in scholarship on Aredia and the scholarship on knowledge production in the Portuguese empire. Um, initially, I became very interested in this idea of gender and I kind of wanted to fill the gap in a kind of facile way and think about how scholars hadn't thought about gen the gendering of his works. However, as I went on reading and reading more secondary literature, I started realizing that gender was not just a gap that can be filled in his work. It was actually a core idea or concept that actually connected many of his other engagements with racial ideology, um, with limpieza de sangre, the times of purity of blood statues, with reproduction, with genealogy, with the production of science, and also sometimes with women as characters, both mythical and historical, that he was engaging with. So today I'd like to talk about one, my research into one of his works, which is called the Declaração de Malacca, India Meridional, como Cathay, so the description of Malacca, southern India, which kind of is a vague idea of Terra Australis, south of Indonesia, and Cathay or China. So in this text, which was dedicated to the king, it was drafted in 1613, it was intended to provide um, knowledge to facilitate imperial governance. So it was basically a description of Malacca and the kind of surrounding areas. So I'd like to think about how gender played a role in this work. How do I define gender? This is a big question. This is probably where I need the most help. Um, I think it's important to think about how in this period, especially when studying cross-cultural interaction, when we talk about gender as a category of analysis, which in which the agenda has been set by oftentimes European scholars in a European context, it's important to also consider that the status of men or women or the concepts of men or women may also have differed in another context in Southeast Asia. So I'm drawing upon the work of Barbara and Daya here, which is very important. And thinking about when we use these words like men and women, we have to be very careful. Um, I'm interested in how gender can be seen not only as a discursive ideology or rhetorical construction, so thinking of Joan Wallach Scott, but also perhaps how we can think of it as a bodily experience thing, an emotive thing, a sexual thing, a performative thing, so drawing upon work from the 1990s like Lyndall Roper and Judith Butler. I think this is very important as well when studying someone who's also self-fashioning his own identity. How does he deploy these gendered beings in his work? How does he understand the gendered body? And how does this inform his own identity? So overall, the, the general question I'm trying to address is just how does he deploy these gender beings? What kind of roles do they play in his work? How does he go about doing this? So I've structured my dissertation to four parts, so I'd like to just go over them briefly as there's not very much time and perhaps you can comment on the structure. Um, instead of kind of looking at each individual section, which I think has been done quite prominently in the historiography, so kind of cherry picking interesting quotations, what I've tried to do is think of the work as a holistic whole and think about gendered themes that kind of run through them through different sections with different characters and try to think of what they mean. So the first thing I'd like to look at is the idea of motherhood, of childbirth and pregnancy. I think the one thing which I mentioned in my abstract was very interesting. He describes the conversion narrative of his mother, who is of course the indigenous one, not his father, who's Portuguese, spends very little time on his father. 
um, in a society which dictated your status based on an idea of limpieza de sangre, or in Spanish, limpieza de sangre, or purity of blood, it's very important to stress the piety of your ancestors, especially if they were new Christians, new converts. So I think he spends a lot of time constructing his mother, the reproducer of himself, as a kind of very pious personages, personage. Excuse me. Um, I think as well this is a very interesting construction because he talks about motherhood in a kind of inverted sense in other contexts. He talks about indigenous sorceresses and he spends a lot of time describing how they disrupt this kind of idea of motherhood, how they engage in practices of infanticide or killing children before baptism, which in a way is a kind of Christian discourse in this period as well. However, I think what's very interesting is he also relates this to Malay myths. So he talks about the Pontianash, which he calls, which in modern Bahasa Malaysia is a Pontianak, and I had a very good conversation earlier about this. The idea of women who died in childbirth who'd become angry, malevolent spirits. So I think what's very interesting is he's combining across these cross-cultural ideas of gender, bringing in ideas of witchcraft from the Malay context, ideas of ghostly stories, but also drawing on Christian narratives of perhaps witchcraft in Europe and the infanticide discourses that were happening there. So that's kind of the first section. The second section looks at ideas of sexuality and age, which I think is quite important because I think age is often left out in studies of gender. People often talk about men and women, but I think there's also categories within those, such as the widow figure or the young woman and all these sorts of things. So I'd like to look at how, again, he's kind of crossing cultural discourses. In some ways, he's kind of an orientalizing figure. He talks about the sensuality of the indigenous dancing girls, but at the same time, he draws upon Malay myths of kind of widowed deities that live in the mountains and kind of engage in these sorcery-like activities and who also kind of lure men or take the figure of young women in order to lure men to them. So I think that sexuality plays a very large role in his work, although I think this is a slightly underdeveloped area in comparison to my other chapters. Thirdly, I'd like to look at his constructions of indigeneity. So this, of course, relates to what I was talking about with his mother earlier. It's very important. But I'd also like to think about ideas of masculinity, how we shouldn't think about men as a default position, in that he constructs himself not only against these idolatrous witches or his mother against these idolatrous witches, but he also constructs himself against other men. So most notably, he constructs himself against other Malay men, so indigenous men. He talks about how they're not interested in intellectual pursuits, which is quite self-conscious because he's writing an intellectual treatise at the time. Um, there's a very interesting self-portrait, which I wish I could show you, but I'm afraid I don't have a PowerPoint. Perhaps in the break I can show you. It's very interesting. Can, this is where kind of Judith Butler comes in, the idea of performativity, of clothing, of how you perform masculinity. Because if you compare his self-portrait with his portrait of a Malay man, you can kind of see how he's distancing himself. He's dressing himself in European clothing. He has his hands on a globe, very Mercator-esque. Whereas the indigenous man is holding, a, well, he has a kris, a spear, very like indigenous ideas of masculinity in terms of, um, it's a kind of a more, he's constructing it as a more violent, simplistic, almost barbaric masculinity. But I also want to nuance this by thinking about how indigenous itself is a complex category. He doesn't distinguish himself just against Islamicized Malays, but also Aboriginal Malays who are still animist in the region. Today they are called Orang Asli, which is original people, but he refers to them as Orang Bunua, so kind of the idea of people of the earth, people of the continent. And the thing is, he describes them in some ways as possessing more knowledge and more curiosity than the Malays, that sometimes they impart knowledge of herbs to the Malays, for example. And yet he also describes them as cannibalistic, like satyrs, very negative terminology. So I think he's defining his own knowledge production, not only through the reproduction through his mother against the sensuous indigenous women, but also against these men. So finally, I'd like to consider one last category, which is this idea of healing, which I think brings all these ideas together because he spends quite a lot of time describing botany, describing medicine, describing um, the plants that are used in medicine. And I think he constructs this dichotomy between, on one side, people who use herbs in the wrong way and people who use them in the right way. He describes female um, indigenous I suppose you could use the word midwives, I'm not exactly sure of the translation, or wet nurses, people who are using medicine for the benefit of other people. But he compares their knowledges, uh, the knowledge that they use to such classical figures as Ptolemy and Galen, which is a whole discourse that I'd like to talk about. But he also talks about people who use 
Hobbes in bad ways. So he goes back to the sorceresses and compares them not to Galen, but to Circe, the ancient figure in the Odyssey who changed all of the men of Odysseus, but not Odysseus, into swine, and how she did this using herbs and potions. So it's kind of thinking about these classical reference of gender as well. So I think healing brings these ideas together because it recenters everything back on knowledge production. Who has the ability to produce knowledge? Is it indigenous women? Is it Aredia as an indigenous man who also produces a treatise on botany? Um, and how can they be conceptualized, neutralized, presented as dangerous, presented as useful? So in conclusion, I think that gender in this way allows us to kind of access many of these threads across Aredia's work. It's not something that's peripheral. It's something that has turned out to be very central and allows a study of his work that cuts across. I think gender also allows this work to be positioned in a slightly more global context. So I'm aware many of you are Philippine specialists. I'm afraid I'm not. Um, so thinking about how in the wider Portuguese empire in this period, or even the wider Iberian empires, how was knowledge gendered? How is it produced? How are indigenous women, indigenous men represented by such authors? And I think most importantly, what is the role of mestizos, people of mixed race, a very prominent category in this period, in this context? What is their role in this pr process of knowledge production? Are they go-betweens? Are they people who embrace indigenous heritage? Or are they perhaps orientalists in disguise? So thank you. So I think 
yes, it's important to consider the role of women in both contexts, but it's also important to read the sources through Eregia, this idea that he's kind of bridging both, but not quite. I don't know if that answered your question. Sorry. <laughs>
conscious that when I use the word race, I have to be very careful. Um, So it's this idea that when the Europeans, when the Portuguese arrived on the West African coast in the 14th, 15th century, excuse me, in the 15th century, the word that they used to describe this vast complexity of African religion and religious practice was kind of fetish, was witchcraft, faith sailor. So I think that the words, when the Europeans arrive in various parts of the world, they bring with them preconceived notions of what they expect to find. So they bring with them this idea of witchcraft. When they see indigenous religious practice, they kind of apply it in that way. And this is why I think it's very interesting that he struggled, uh, perhaps struggling is the wrong word because I can't see inside his head, but from the written evidence, I can posit that he's struggling to kind of categorize these Pontianak. He's saying, are they another type of sorceress? Are they a ghost figure? He's trying to kind of relate it to the European system of categorization. Um, I think this is also related as well to the kind of classical reference he's this idea that he could draw on a vast variety of things he encountered in his, in his Jesuit education. So for example, when he sees a, a doctor, he decides to compare them to Galen, the kind of classical revived Greek figure that was very important in Renaissance medicine. When he sees a witch and he wants to kind of describe her sensuality or use of potions, he goes immediately to Circe or Kirka as a kind of reference. So I think when Europeans arrive in these places, they're bringing this came up in an earlier talk, but I think it's very difficult to think about. It's very difficult to think about how the indigenous Malays that are not already and not writing actually conceived of their own practice and their own gender in this period, because there's very little written down. This is why I have a big problem with people considering already as this unproblematic indigenous figure, because he's really not. He's very, very westernized. Um, and while he does incorporate Malay words into his work, he also does incorporate almost a form of Catholic Orientalism, to use the word of Shadia and Zuckerman. So I think that's kind of a long-winded way of saying the Europeans brought their own ideas to kind of categorize what they saw, and they didn't necessarily map up to indigenous ones, unfortunately. Or fortunately. Usually. <laughs> Uh, my presentation is uh, basically about my uh, PhD thesis, so I'm in my fourth year now, so I'm trying to uh, consolidate my findings, and so I'm glad that Chase gave his talk before me, because I guess that's the same predicament I'm in, so how to bridge. Oh. Uh, so we're back, and uh, like I was saying earlier, my uh, presentation is basically an attempt to try to consolidate my findings for my PhD uh, research in history, but it basically stretches from for over four centuries, so 1595 to 2013. So, yeah, I've been having some issues with how to properly frame the different 
crises or adversity that people had to confront and for which identity or labels at least served as some sort of a rallying point for uh, generating solidarity and overcoming these crises or hardships. So I am uh, using Professor Rafael's uh, notions which he introduced in contracting colonialism. So listening as fishing. So the example of uh, the Padre Damaso's sermon, which we will see examples of it actually happening in, in at least in some or later. And, uh, remembering as hunting, so these heroes uh, visiting Pedro Calosa in jail in Hawaii or uh, wherever he went, trying to encourage him to form these associations to free the poor from uh, oppression. So, and yeah, the role of stories, narratives, and not necessarily just the No Limitangere or other texts which. Uh, was important in Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, but stories, even bedtime stories, that can cr have uh, stories about the revolution, about the Balanghiga massacre told to kids, who, and it resonates across their lives. And uh, yeah, the role of uh, these personalities in history or in more recent history, or people you know personally as uh, examples of people who have overcome crises and could serve as example for other uh, new crises like Yolanda, when they were dealing with World War II, but somehow you could call upon their experiences for generating solidarity and overcoming this new crisis. So I'll be presenting some examples from these different periods. And uh, again, they play on words, or in this case, the word waray, which, uh, as Adrian had explained, is part of this uh, Visayan umbrella, but uh, in our case, it's not just the low-class uncouth uh, meanings, but also had this element of fearsomeness or kilabut in Tagalog, kilabut na waray waray or waray waray gang, so generated terror among uh, people in, like, uh, in Manila. But in the case of Yolanda, so they play around with these words and trying to say that, yeah, we've overcome poverty, we've overcome all these other difficulties. And uh, it's not just the word waray, but older identities like pintados, which, as I argue in, the, uh, in my abstract, so were imposed from outside, from the Spaniards, the painted ones, or waray, to refer to the migrants in Manila who were seeking kaupayan, well-being, or health, but not finding uh, their fortune and greeting each other. How are you? Waray, waray upay, you know, good. So that became a stereotype that these are the Warai people, people who have no money, good for nothing, people who engage in crime, that uh, find their fortune. So again, you, play, you see these coming back again after Yolanda, we've overcome poverty. So if you can overcome that, you can overcome this. And also uh, other historical examples like uh, the social movements and anti-Japanese uh, resistance in World War II. Even though, again, we go back to the fictive element of local or folk history where uh, you know, we fought World War II, but Tacloban was actually not the center of resistance. It was the capital and it was therefore a collaborator town. But, but still, they you know, play with history, localized history, to try to say that we did this before. Uh, when I interviewed the guy who did this signboard, he actually said that he had more. He had took 400 years of under the Spaniards, but his paint was washed away, so he had to settle with <laughs> a few uh, words. And again, uh, back to uh, the selective appropriation of labels where uh, pintados, where it can denote savages for some Spaniards, to the natives, so it denoted their ferocity. So this was a more ancient notion, that a self-image they had, that uh, for some reason they kept attaching to these new words, which was applied to them negatively, but for them was still meaningful in the face of these new emergencies or uh, adversities. So same descriptions by different uh, observers. So one, a Italian traveler who happened to pass by Samar late in 1697, and uh, a uh, Samaranyo priest when describing how 
the Waray uh, li linguistic label came to be applied to migrants to Manila in uh, the post-war period, where the Waray Waray uh, terminology came uh, emerged. And uh, it's not just local history, but also local values. And uh, uh, the guy uh, who did the We Fought in World War II billboard, yeah, he had a son who was also doing art and was part of this local group of uh, street artists inspired by Banksy. And, uh, but they, he revealed that uh, he, it was him who had triggered what his father did, and the father got all the publicity in the international media, but he was saying, yeah, I did it, and the media kept asking for who did this. And they wrote it to him, and when the father was being approached by these media personalities, so he started to create these billboards to uh, assist in the recovery process to these different uh, messages. But. Uh, I just rediscovered this recently, and it turned out that uh, the symbols he had corresponded with the three concepts I was dealing with in my research. So you had the crisis, whether it was war or disaster or epidemic disease, and unity, onung, which was had a deeper meaning and shaped by history, by uh, slave raids, by uh, the apocalypse when the Spaniards or the missionaries introduced the messianic time and uh, end, of the end of the world and uh, now with Yolanda and resilience so that became absorbed as well and Kaupayan which as Chase was mentioned about healing and in this case the millenarian movements who continued to resist the Americans fighting for village independence rather than national independence and the elites had surrendered they were trying to consolidate American rule but the Americans were surprised why do these villages keep resisting and joining this uh, local popes and uh, yeah the, these uh, leaders were usually healers in Tambalan and although no longer the Babylon so again the gendered element from early Babylon resistance uh, Tamblut, Asog or effeminate male resistance and then by the revolution it was mostly male uh, healers who were resisting uh, colonial rule or uh, getting rid of the disease of colonialism, so contracting colonialism, so how do you heal yourself from colonialism? You join these healers who uh, were trying to uh, heal society by uh, ousting the Spaniards from the Philippines and later the Americans. And again, uh, the personalities, folk heroes, where uh, after the arrival of the Americans, they were being taught in uh, the schools, but again, appropriated locally. So they appear in these local folk songs where, uh, again, like the Kalosa episode, uh, heroes returning in other forms or uh, still seeking true independence or to finish the unfinished revolution. And how they were transmitted, so not only in schools or through sermons, but uh, also it's a bedtime story, so oral, female oriented oral traditions, bedtime stories, folk songs, which uh, people associated with family, with community. So a different, a local form of nationalism, is, I suppose. And uh, again, that, where does the Isog uh, self-image come from? So it goes much deeper to legends lo like the local Bernardo Carpio. So in the Samar Leyte area, it's the Makandog family. It's, they don't really have a name, it's just a description. Makandog is a, or Morong Burong, and according to Alcina in 1668, which is tall guy and uh, fog or clouds. Uh, but those were their ancestors, and it's still part of the stories. And as can be seen in this uh, article about the Suluan women who lighted up their communities after Yolanda. So still the narratives handed down through tradition uh, and not necessarily in history books. So some uh, conclusions. Uh, so again, the interplay of outsider stereotypes versus positive stereotypes, so selective appropriation against adversity. Uh, so promotion of older mutual aid or uh, collective traits, 
our values and um, again historical context, changing context, but same values and uh, different modes of transmission, oral, radio, now Facebook, and uh, in pursuit of Kaupayan, which was the last triangle pointing up to so freedom, salvation, or health, well-being. Um, so any inputs would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, it's debated and again, again contested because we don't really have a specific fixed term like Tagalog or Bisaya. So it's sometimes called Samarlite Bisayan or Linate Samarnon or Waray. So that's our problem. We don't have a fixed name because when you say Waray, it denotes people without anything. Or uh, So the elites would back off from... Some Linate Samarnon, some are Linate Bisayan, or uh, all these other uh, contrived names, but all the other people, they just uh, stick to what I, because yeah, that's us, it's, we're struggling against poverty. You know? So in Facebook, you always see these debates coming up every few months, for, and it's a never-ending debate, because we don't have a fixed term, because, yes, I argue, it's all these crises, slave raids, and accidents of history, you know? <laughs> So we don't, we, I don't think we can have one because we have all these histories still being transmitted by, uh, in stories, in songs, in history books, hopefully. <laughs> Christmas, yeah. So that, there's also the debate. Was it Limasawa? Or? <laughs> yeah, tied up with yeah, different Visayan identities, I suppose. Yeah, and then the history element. <laughs> Similar language, different experiences. So I suppose that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm arguing that yeah, some of it can come from school. So how would they know about Del Pilar, for instance? Or although yeah, there would be the use the use would cite Burgos. So I suppose it was through the sermons that the priests were denouncing these guys, Rizal, as a German spy. But but then they were imagining a German ship coming to free uh, the Visayas from the Spaniards. So again, fishing for meanings. Yeah, some of it, yeah, you know, but a lot of it, yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah, but it's also the oral tradition, which is still quite strong. So, for instance, about Balanghiga, there will be books written about it, but there would also be the folk song that, in the, in the, in the, where were you when Balanghiga burned? For seven years it burned, but the smoke was never seen. So very evocative uh, imagery and very metaphorical. Oh, but. Uh, people are still singing it, so, or dancing the corazza. Or, so. mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it is uh, still a quite strong uh, event, and it resonates because of the songs. So, historians might be writing about it, but locally they have this local imagination of what happened. Binabuy kami ng mga Amerikano. The other. 
Oh, Meron. Uh, oh, especially after Yolanda, that's where you see a reference to Bajau hoping to get the relief goods or the uh, NPAs. So th there was a Philippine flag in Palo and they saw it as a communist flag. And my brother was like, but it's a Philippine flag. But <laughs> people were interpreting it as the NPAs coming down from the mountains to get the relief goods or uh, prisoners go going to rape and pillage in the homes. So that was their notion of otherness, the uh, marginalized, the uh, et ethnic minorities or the communists from the countryside at least from a Tacloban perspective. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Sharmila. I'm in my second year. Um, in gender studies, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Cambridge. Um, so just a quick background. I used to work in anti-trafficking, and that's when I was inspired to do this PhD. Uh, I'll just like get the definitional stuff out of the way. So there is a very technical legal definition of trafficking, which is like, I'll give you like a very condensed version. An act that may involve recruiting, paying for, harboring, transporting, or maintaining a person using any of the following means, like fraud, coercion, abuse of their vulnerability, abuse of your power, for purposes of exploitation. Exploitation can be exploitation of their labor, sexual exploitation, selling their organs, right? This is a loose definition at this rate. Um, so I used to work in anti-trafficking, and I made some observations about sex trafficking in particular, and what, what knowledge claims were being made about sex workers. So I use sex workers uh, because I also have specific ideological commitments, like I, I do think sex work is work. Um, this is in itself a debate, this whole linguistic framing of it. Some people will argue that I'm wrong and I should be using women in prostitution. So a lot of radical feminists take this position. The neutral term is prostitutes, which I may also like transition into because they're interchangeable. So just getting those definitions out of the way. Now, what I'm examining in uh, my dissertation is what are the knowledge claims being made by the, an the Philippine anti-trafficking industry about uh, prostitutes and sex workers? How are those knowledge claims produced and negotiated? So who gets to speak? Who doesn't get to speak? What are the resulting policy implications of these knowledge claims, which have commonly been raids, rescue operations, and sheltering sex workers um, who have been rescued? And how do these conceptions square with the lived realities of sex workers themselves? Uh, I guess if I would situate this, this is really more like policy studies, but a bit more critical. Um, so a lot of my in research methods included speaking to sex workers themselves and asking them, those who are subjected to state interventions, asking them about these encounters with the state, with the police, with healthcare officials. The gist is, are you better off as a result of being sheltered, as a result of the raids, and as a result of the rescue operations? Um, and uh, asking them about the nature of their work and comparing data from these interviews with what official discourse on anti-trafficking says about this vulnerable population. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a work in progress and it's really, really messy and I'm currently drowning in interview data. But there, some observations I think that you might be able to help me work through are, uh, I do want to historicize sex work in the Philippines a bit more and I think this is a weak spot of, of the project um, I know that there have been a lot of colonial interventions that involve the policing of women's sexuality and imposing like more Western frameworks and gender relationships because um, so the Carolyn Brewer text that I was referencing earlier talks about like a much more loose and uh, free conception of female sexuality uh, and the historical antecedents to prostitution as we know it now. So that's one thing that I would like to be able to do better for this, to show that our conception of trafficking wasn't at historical, like this is a political process. This was influenced heavily by uh, other actors. Second interesting thing is um, 
but the popular depictions of sex work or prostitution in the Philippines always involve like a caricature of a local innocent woman being exploited by a foreign man. There is very little mention of, especially if we're talking about adult women, there's very little mention of the local clientele. So it's always framed as a, as a asymmetrical colonial encounter. And I mean, I imagine there's something there in terms of how the nation is conceived as a body of a woman that's being defiled, but these are all very loose thoughts. This, this is the aspect of the thesis I haven't like really engaged with yet because I've been with on the interview side. So, you know, any thoughts you have will be appreciated. That, that's really it. <laughs> so I haven't referenced for this yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm taking notes. Cynthia F. Lowe references this a, a bit in Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, yeah. but I don't have this specific. Yeah, yeah I will yeah, look so, this so up. Thank you. legalization of prostitution in the Philippines from the feminist movement yeah. derives heavily from the military exactly. connection. in Philippine law right now because officially under the penal code the sale of sex is criminalized under the anti-trafficking law it can, it can be interpreted as a strong suggestion that sex work, most women in prostitution are victims um, and the feminist movement in general is advocating for an anti-prostitution law that follows the Nordic model that decriminalizes the sale because the assumption is the woman is a victim, sex worker is a victim and has no control over what's happening and punishes the clients and the managers and the pimps. So um, the anti-trafficking movement has gotten behind this, uh, the, the, this um, formulation of uh, prostitution. 
Um, I get why that's happening. I think it is a reaction. And they explicitly say that this is a way to correct for the perception that you know, the prostitute is like an evil home wrecker person with an out of control sexuality that society stigmatizes. This is an attempt to reduce the stigma, right? Plus it stems from a genuine belief that it's really an unequal power relationship and it's rooted in the patriarchy and you can't, it can't ever be a situation where the actor involved exercises agency. Um, when I speak to the women, in, in, based on the interview data I have, this is not quantitative, this is like 50 women. Um, a lot, so they do not, most of them do not conceive of what we would call pimps, so they call them bugaus, as people who exploit them. A lot of times these are distant relatives or friends that they view as sources of income or people who provided them economic opportunities or who protect them from abusive clients or who negotiate with the police on their behalf, who give them low interest loans, who pay for their abortions when they need them. There are obviously, um, there are abusive pimps, but in the predominant, like, in terms of most of the answers, they conceive of their pimps as friends or as people who help them. So that's one. In terms of clients, so the anti-trafficking movement has a tendency to portray clients as abusive, violent, depraved men who have no respect for women whatsoever. This seems to be the minority of cases that women describe. A lot of times they're just like regular people, um, sometimes quite insecure. They speak of their regular clients with fondness. They're like, they're just like our friends. 10% um, of the time goes to sex, 90% goes to chats. <laughs> like, so that's what they say. Um, in nine out of 10 cases, the abuser is a cop, not a client, um, which is why they're very opposed to any policy that increases their exposure to cops or increases the police's power of them. I do want to share that an int I mean, I don't want to call it interesting because it's appalling. Thing that happened that I did not anticipate when I started this research was a drug war that Professor Afanas talked about extensively, and it has affected sex workers in two ways that I've identified in my interviews. One, because of this link between sex work and drugs, and sometimes feminists, without realizing the implications of what they're doing, keep pointing to this link to demonstrate that sex workers lack agency. But it is not safe to keep making that link in this regime of a violent drug war, because many sex workers that I've spoken to have disappeared, gone into hiding, or have or by many, like seven, have been confirmed to have been shot because they show up in these random drug lists. It is entirely possible that some of them have been using drugs, but I don't think it's a reason to kill people. So that's one. Next, a lot of them are now less able to like go to the street because they're afraid that they'll get shot, they'll get exposed, they'll be seen with a client who's known to be using drugs, which means a lot of them, their income has decreased. Many of them are less willing to speak to people. So in the past, they were very candid with me. Now they're just like, are you working with the police? Are you sure you're not working with the police? So there's a lot of that. Finally, I've spoken to two of them whose husbands were killed under Tokang, and they weren't doing sex work before that, but because of the increased precarity, they are now going into sex work. So these were things I did not expect when I <laughs> started the project, but it might actually, come, it might actually like be a part of it now. It is sad. <laughs> So this is a very heated debate in feminism. It's never going to get resolved. Like on the one hand, you have one side that's just like it's impossible to exercise agency in this kind of relationship. On the other hand, there's like oh, it's fully empowered. Neither of those frames is really useful, especially a lot of this literature is written in the West. There's a bit more now about South South Asia, Latin America, some about the Philippines. Um, so my the argument that I'm getting at right now is. There is some agency involved here. Like there, so the framework I'm using is adaptive preferences in that their choices are extremely circumscribed and they are aware of this. So they're aware of the limited control that they have, but they seek to direct whatever benefit they can to themselves given that limited control. So they're aware that the alternatives they have are factory work, domestic work, or just complete dependence on a, on a partner who might be abusive or have no job. Um, 
in terms of transacting with customers, there is a demonstration of agency as well, obviously quite limited, when they will say things like, we obviously manipulate their emotions. Like at first we're very nice and we're very sweet and you have to be firm with them when you enter the room so they don't abuse you. You have to like speak in a really like firm tone of voice and go, you must put on a condo. And like you have to have ties with the hotel staff so that your customer doesn't run away without paying or if he abuses you, you know the staff, you know the front desk, they're going to call the police for you or they'll just beat him up for you. Um, or sometimes if they work in bars to circumvent the because you have to split the um, profit with the bar owners of the bar fine, right? Circumvent this, they just negotiate with the customers on a one-on-one, -on -one, especially if it's a regular and trust has been established. So these are obviously like very circumscribed situations, but they have shown like cognizance of the limited control they have. There's an awareness of like decision-making that's happening. So I'm still like developing this idea to demonstrate that there is some agency enough that we need to listen to them and their voices when making policy about them because they are not officially consulted. The people who are consulted in the anti-trafficking sector are sex workers who have been rescued or, or who sought help who then turn into survivors and spokesperson for the spokespersons for the anti-trafficking movement and who predominantly are against the legalization of sex work and say that it's inherently exploitative which is like a view I completely respect although I'm also a bit critical of this because Obviously, these women are dependent on the anti-trafficking organizations that rescue them for economic survival. And given the stigma of sex work, it's very hard to come forward and say, no, actually, I chose to get into that. Like, there's a lot of emphasis on, on which women deserve our help and which women don't, right? So I think that's, that, that's also a theme that I'm exploring. It's a mixture, so a lot of them complain about the stigma they get even from their own families. But there's also some degree of defiance, so I'm gonna say it in Filipino, then I'll translate it. So they'll say things like, pinapalamon namin, na, pinapalamon namin kayo. So we feed you, family, so why are you condemning us? Or um, some of it is a bit more obscene, but like I, I really like it. So there's like, to the manager, Akala mo, ikaw yung nakabuka ka buong gabi, a bangers ka lang yan. So basically, you just sit there and wait for me to give you money. But I'm the one who spreads my legs every night. Like, so there are some of these fighting words as well. And they're like, bakit ako mahihiya? Malinis yung trabaho ko. So why will I be ashamed? I'm doing an honest job. I'm not a corrupt politician. I'm not stealing money from anyone. I'm not raping anyone. And there, a lot of times, they contrast themselves to policemen. Because <laughs> these are the people they interact with a lot. And they're like, I haven't stolen anything. But they steal our money. So things like that. The, the other interesting, I mean, I just got reminded, the other interesting thing is this weird microeconomy of bribery. So the cops expect them to preemptively pay bribes so that they don't get uh, arrested or even just shooed away. Because there are prime areas where you have maximum exposure to customers. And if you don't pay bribes, then it's hard for you to like stand there. You have to move to a corner where you're less visible. And even among the women, there's some infighting. So the ones who pay bribes get mad at those who don't because then they all get raided. So, yes, it's, a, it's exactly what you were saying earlier, right? But except they're really vulnerable and can't fight it. Um, and so like one anecdote was this woman who said one, for one week she didn't pay the 800 bribe. Perhaps I'm just translating is about 10 pounds, 10, 12 pounds. She didn't pay it. And then when a customer was about to approach her, Another woman who pays the bribe says, um, don't go to that woman, she's infected. <laughs> and I'm like, I see. <laughs> so these things. Um, because cops have a lot of power in either, even in an anti-trafficking, even if the anti-trafficking establishment works as well as they want it to work, it will still involve cops exercising a lot of power with these women. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Seb. Uh, I'm at Warwick University in the Department of Politics and International Studies. I'm uh, in the third year of my PhD and 
I am not a Philippines expert, so it's just me and you, Chase. We got some uh, shared uh, common ground. Uh, but I would love your um, opinions, feedback, uh, and uh, yeah, just want you to know how interesting my PhD is. No, uh, so uh, I'm looking at the uh, political economy of Christian conversion among a marginalised ethnic minority group in v Vietnam. So uh, the group that I research um, are called the Hmong. They're a uh, transnational group spread across the borderlands of Vietnam, China, Laos, Thailand, and some US and Australian diasporas. They uh, uh, have a history of uh, marginalization, uh, impoverishment, but also uh, kind of they're seen as by state authorities as quite independent and difficult to govern in uh, the kind of James Scott's art of not being governed framework, if, if you're familiar with that. Uh, they also have a history of uh, religion as a source of political mobilization, so that there's a history of messianic or millenarian movements uh, in which uh, religion can be a great mobilizing factor, but also cause a lot of uh, inter-ethnic disunity and conflict at the same time. Uh, and in Vietnam, they're the bottom of the list of ethnic minorities in terms of highest poverty rates, lowest education rates, and they're kind of stigmatized as backwards, and they have their own language, which no one bothers learning. And in the last 40 years, uh, they've all been converting to Christianity, uh, Protestant Christianity, uh, out of nowhere, which no one was expecting. Well, they might have expected it if they'd looked at the history. But it came as a big shock to the Vietnamese government because there wasn't any missionaries there. It came through these uh, radio broadcasts uh, from some American evangelical radio uh, station, but based in, the, in Manila, actually. So there's my link to the Philippines. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, so for whatever reason, which I don't have time to go into, the message really resonated with a lot of people, and uh, now there's uh, about 300 to 400,000 Hmong Christians out of a population of 1 million in Vietnam and rising. So I look at the effects, the political and economic effects primarily, uh, in a context of, uh, at the same time, uh, an expansion of the market economy into the, the, the highlands uh, in Vietnam where the government are trying to get people into the market economy and uh, stop them from becoming, from being self-sufficient and trying to get them into the cash economy. Uh, so uh, some of the effects uh, is a huge uh, range of effects of Christian conversion. There's rise of new elites within communities, these pastors who are younger than the normal uh, elites and challenge local authorities and have a lot of uh, uh, power because everyone listens to them, that the, the Hmong don't always listen to the government. Um, and um, there's uh, new attitudes towards uh, um, money and uh, productivity and, uh, and this changing lifestyles as evidence of kind of neo barbarian uh, kind of discipline, ethic, and, uh, and uh, pastors seen as kind of uh, encouraging their congregation to uh, move away from like wasteful practices of traditional rituals and, and become more uh, entrepreneurial and try and help them get out of their poverty situation. But uh, I guess the thing that I want to very briefly talk about and ask in relation to especially what you were talking about from a Foucauldian point of view is, uh, and linked to your work about um, conversion and translation as well, uh, you know, oftentimes, especially in the historical colonial context, conversion is seen as a kind of hand in hand with colonialism and it's a kind of seen as conversion as submission. So uh, conversion to uh, this Western uh, imperial force uh, that that's uh, the, the natives are having to submit and be dominated whereas in this context it's quite interesting and arguably conversion can be seen as resistance because uh, even Christian conversion 
is a conversion away from the, what is uh, the kind of dominant Buddhist uh, religious framework of, of the rest of the country. And so uh, they are kind of embracing an alternative modernity, which may well end up the, bringing them into the capitalist fold eventually, but uh, for the time being is also quite confrontational with uh, Vietnamese uh, state agendas and has caused a lot of conflict. Uh, there's been a lot of persecution of non-Christians. And so how, to what degree is... Uh, uh, and, and Vietnamese government actors have seen Christianity among the Hmong as a threat. They've seen it as something that uh, hostile forces might be using to try and uh, undermine social order in, in, in their socialist utopia, right? Um, but then at the same time, Christianity uh, shares some common goals with uh, the Vietnamese state-led development agenda. They both want to make people more productive. They, they both uh, want people to uh, kind of embrace the market economy. And so there's some things where uh, these two forces are working together, and sometimes they seem to come up against each other. Uh, but at, through all of this, uh, I kind of stick to a, a, a strong view of Hmong agency in that they're not just being affected by these external forces, but they're actively choosing which forces to uh, align to and uh, you know, in a, in a position of marginalization, they should still show agency in, in selecting their kind of tactics to engage with these external powers. And so uh, I use kind of everyday politics concepts from Kurt Lear and James Scott as well. Um, so, yeah, that's about all I've got to say. So I'd like to hear what, what uh, your thoughts are, really. So the, the Hmong, are, there's a, about oh, just over a million Hmong in Vietnam. So and how many of them have been converted? About 300 to 400,000. So it's quite big and it's growing. It could be a, you know, 50% in 10, 20 years' time. And who's doing the conversion? So initially the, the, the input was from this uh, Christian radio station. Uh, so there weren't any missionaries on the ground, which is another reason which... I could, would argue for is like the Hmong showing agency within themselves or certain groups of Hmong uh, actively converting and then going on to convert others. Now there is more input from international Christian networks, uh, but for a long time it was quite an isolated thing. Uh, like no one even knew that these people were becoming Christians for like 10 years and then word got out that there was 100,000 Christians up in the hill, hills and the government didn't like it kind of thing. So they literally started revolting. Mm, yeah. They're yeah, kind of like drawing warfare. Uh, I suppose so, yes. You know, religion being the bombs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It means remote conversion. Mm, yeah. So different than Catholics, where you actually have the press, you need the presence of the clergy. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is why I think it's a really interesting case study because even in Protestant. So, so what difference does it make? You have the earlier generation converted through Lotte, and then the new generation, they're now beset by all these missionaries coming in, and with that sort of ramping up of Catholic development in Vietnam itself. Mm. So that is the different conditions. So there are differences within, like the first generation of of kind of church leaders who converted from listening to the radio station to the newer generation of people who grew up in Christian families and more likely to become students and go study in Hanoi and go to like a Bible school there, which they didn't, like when they first converted, it took them years to even find the Christian church in, in Hanoi. They, uh, when the, the radio station told them to go down to Hanoi and find the Christians, and then they got to the Catholic Church and all became Catholics. And then after a while, they were like, wait, this isn't quite right. And then they found the Protestant Church and they were like, oh, yeah, this sounds right. Uh, but yeah, the new generation, 
are more likely to be uh, also in connection with like a, a wider transnational Hmong population, which spreads as far as America. In London, no, I can't find any. It's a nightmare. There's some in France, though, uh, because they were role in the Indochina War, so some of them became refugees at that time. It's quite a bit in Seattle. Yes, yes, over in the West Coast. Yeah. I was curious, because you said that you talked about the lack of missionaries. So to what extent is this conversion to a religion rather than an ideology that they see as politically useful to them? Um, I was quite curious, because you talked about how they went to the Catholic Church and then to the Protestant Church. Was this a kind of Sure. So, not that Christianity is one thing either. Mm. Don't apply that. Yeah. So, I I would have to say that that question depends on your own conceptual framework. I, I'm I'm coming from a, a kind of cultural political economy framework uh, where I'm I often fall into the trap of uh, seeing religion in quite instrumental terms and looking at its effects on. Uh, political relations, and in fact, uh, again, quite unusually, I, I, I argue that in, in s several aspects, Christian conversion can be seen as quite an empowering thing, but that's not necessarily how they would uh, see it. Um, certainly, the time of mass change, call it conversion or call it something else, was in a time of economic crisis, uh, the uh, the doi mei uh, economic reforms had just started and they cut all the subsidies to these uh, collectivized uh, plantations which they quit tried getting all the Hmong to work on and then it didn't work out and so there was a there was a, a kind of economic crisis and uh, then there's this message coming from abroad of this hope of salvation and it's in the Hmong language there's nothing else on the radio station in Hmong language so. That's a very appealing. There's a so th there's a, a, there's definitely like a lot of different elements to this uh, this um, new input, religious, uh, ethnic, arguably political and economic, and um, but then when you interview them, the older generation, or the most common reason they they say is. Uh, our old customs were really getting quite expensive and we had to sacrifice this buffalo when uh, someone died and we were all really poor and we couldn't afford it anymore. But this new religion says you don't have to sacrifice anything anymore because the sacrifice has already been paid by Jesus, etc. And so that was great and uh, this new God will protect us from all the bad things that will happen when we stop doing the sacrifices. So in that sense, that seems, sounds like a very religious cultural explanation to conversion. So I guess there's a really good um, book by uh, Tum Ngo called The New Way, which is how they define Protestantism, or that's what they call it in their language. And this is more anthropological. I'm more on the political economy side of impact since conversion. So uh, there was a uh, there was a, a a a group of Hmong who fought in the uh, Cold War for America uh, in Laos. When that all fell apart, a lot of them managed to become refugees in America, and so they got one of these people, the Hmong people, to do the broadcasting in the Hmong language. So it was targeted, but they still didn't know that they'd hit anything for. Yeah. 10 years or something before messages finally got out from the highlands back to the radio station. Yeah. Yeah, 
right. And then so uh, the whole Foucauldian concepts of governmentality and, and biopolitics, I sometimes think is quite like is very much emphasizing the power of uh, strong actors, either government actors or market forces in fashioning and um, disciplining uh, local people. Uh, but, uh, and I think there's a lot of that going on, but at the same time, I kind of want to emphasize the agency of uh, well, people who are making their own decisions as well. Vietnamese communist exactly, uh, exactly. surveillance regime. Exactly, exactly. But then in, in a sense, like the, the step on from that is self-governance, self-governmentality where you can internalize it and get people to look after themselves. And uh, maybe that's something is like more about what's happening among. Well, that's exactly the conduct of conduct. Yeah. kind of see that going on, but, well, maybe the, uh, the s structures are, they're not that well established in, in non-Christian networks, they're quite loose, uh, but I would say there's, there's, but can this describe us better? Yeah. Okay, so unlike Catholics, we don't have a very rich liturgical life, it's mm. very stripped down, yeah. the center is the Bible, mm. so that's what you should go after, and my guess is that Absolutely is. Oh. First generation did not, so there was the radio station was their only source, and oftentimes they were taking this and then merging it with their own uh, concepts of spirituality and the spiritual realm. And you got some interesting sects and stuff happening, but but more recently now the Hmong language Bibles are being s smuggled in because they're banned in Vietnam. But uh, but these days it's not. It's very easy to get past the. Uh, Order. 
yeah, oftentimes the church leader was just the first person in the village who heard about it and uh, became the de facto church leader. Um, and, and a lot of, well, some of these church leaders have risen to become kind of like big men in their community and they held immense uh, authority due to their combination of like spiritual authority, but also they become these like political brokers where they speak on behalf of the people and sometimes stand up to the authorities, sometimes, you know, do deals with the authorities and end up becoming quite rich. And, uh, but they're very well connected and, and they become players in the local political economies. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Nagak. Um, I'm graduating for my BA, um, BA Psychosocial Studies here at Birkbeck. And before I start or give you an, what I'm working on, my tutor actually gave me instructions to tell you what a psychosocial studies is because most people do not know what psychosocial studies. Um, it is actually an interdisciplinary which primarily focuses on post-colonial gender and social theories and then intersecting it with psychoanalysis. So to quote um, Birkbeck's psychosocial department, um, psychosocial studies enables us to unravel the interconnected psychic and social forces that produce us as people and to determine our complex relations to one another. While sociology students study the social world and psychology students study the brain and behavior, psychosocial, studi psychosocial study students investigate the relation between individuals and the social sphere, how people are made up of the relationships they have with one another and with the world around them. This means deepening our understanding of the emotional, imaginary and symbolic aspects of living together. So for my BA dissertation, I am working on um, the overseas Filipino woman domestic worker, which is one identity which is currently brought into the global spotlight in recent years. So concerning discourse which are circulating within the Philippines and globally with regards to the different forms of oppressions, um, some say it is a modern form of slavery that are experienced by OFWs are ubiquitous. One current incident which spiked more debate regarding the welfare and protection of OFWs was the brutal death of Joanna Dimafilis in Kuwait um, her body was found inside a freezer in uh, February this year. So this violence inflicted towards OFW is not new. One of the most publicized and debated incident concerning oppression resulting to a death of an OFW was the hanging of uh, Flor Contemplacion in Singapore in 1995. So with this reason, my dissertation wants to revisit to emphasize as well, reanalyze published works, particularly of Rachel Parenas, regarding the identity of the overseas Filipino woman domestic worker, but particularly using a psychosocial approach. Um, quoting uh, Stephen Frosch, by using a psychosocial perspective, the research aims to present a humanistic, therapeutic one, a mode of personalizing or humanizing form of research 
or analysis. Also, psychosocial work rescues agency and emotion to reconstitute a holistic individual who still has to be theorized in relation to an often persecutory outside. So with this in mind, through using psychosocial theories in, in the reanalysis, we might be able to find gaps to further understand and illuminate the subjectivity, subject position, and agency of the OFW, particularly as Filipino mother within contemporary Filipino society. So I'm concentrating on these temporalities because the dissertation aims to get into the origin, this my origin here is non-monolithic as well, of how an OFW identity is partially constructed and represented by being mothers in the Philippines in modern globalized time. I'm also thinking on how an identity like an OFW is also a product of history, wherein it is highly interlinked with colonialism, which then implicates how Filipino society constructs identities, subjectivity, and subject position. Also to note that um, within psychoanalysis, the mother is theorized as the repository of different forms of anxieties of the infant, which can also be interpreted in social contexts as women or mothers as repository of social anxieties. So the research intends to present the intersection between the psychic and the social space, focusing on contemporary Filipino identity. Furthermore, it wants to find answers on how a subject can find a form of agency, even from within structures of power, which is very Foucauldian as well, and to be a platform to fill Filipino feminism and subaltern studies. Since the focus of the dissertation is on overseas Filipino woman domestic worker, um, the research will evaluate on how Filipino woman identity is socially constructed and represented and how it affects their subjectivity. And to quote Parenas as well, she said, Filipino feminists have argued that Filipino women have long been constructed in Filipino society as nothing more than dutiful daughters and suffering mothers, which is an ideology which is rooted within the Catholic faith. So I really want to take the suffering mother's concept and connect it into a more in a psychoanalysis deconstruction as well on how she is represented as both suffering mother in the Philippines at the same time, how she internalized or does she internalize that whole concept as her own subject and is she encapsulated only as suffering mothers or a suffering mother so yeah so that's that i know sometimes i mean it gets a bit for me it's quite difficult to explain psychosocial as well because some sometimes psychoanalysis could be a bit daunting to some people i mean for me as a filipino Who's, oh, who's um, read psychoanalysis, Freud, Lacan, and, and um, Dion and Winnicott as well. It is a very Eurocentric point of view. There is no doubting on that. And so you have to deconstruct a European conception and try to relate it into um, my own sense of, of culture. And it's quite difficult to navigate within those lines, but I'll get there somehow. <laughs> yes. Exactly, same questions that my supervisor has already asked me. So I told her that I think it would be very realistic if I focus on Rachel Perenia's work. So she has transcripts already. And the transcripts that she has provided are quite varied. So there's a children's point of view on how they see their mothers, which is you could really get into the detail 
of abandonment and jealousy and envy. Again, going back to psychoanalysis. But at the same time, I was told that do not take it from, oh, sorry, um, digressing. So um, Rachel Perenia's work focusing on the transcripts coming from the mother, not from the children, to give voices to mothers to see how their stories are told. So yes. Yes. Mm. It's actually varied. So when I say, um, so that's the reason why I really just want to focus on mothers. And these mothers also have descriptions of their lives in the Philippines before moving out of the Philippines as well to be OFWs. Yes. So I'm already apologizing in advance if this is irrelevant for psychoanalysis, but my master's thesis is very similar in the theme. Um, but I, I was just wondering if you have ever engaged with the theme of the neoliberal governmentality mm -hmm. and how it shapes uh, conceptions of what good motherhood is. Mm. Okay, so thank you. That's a very interesting um, question. The one thing that Perenius also talks about is, I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, but one way I could see it is in a Filipino social uh, construct, there's within the family, the father is known as Saligin ng Tahanan, pillar of the home. The mother is Ilaw ng Tahanan, which is the light of the home. So what happens, according to Parenas, is if the father could not provide or provide enough for the family, then this globalized new liberal issue of who does provide enough. And then the mothers then become default breadwinners or th they both care and provide for, for the family. That is that, that's the reason why where we say in psychoanalysis, the mothers then become a repository of, an, of social anxiety or a family anxiety. It's always, not, sorry, not to generalize, sometimes it's the mothers who get um, anxieties of the family or the society. SBJ. Yes. I think it would be part of my literature, but coming from a subaltern study point of view, because she does, you know, Gayatri Spiva could always say, she's, you know, very much Marxist, no doubting on that. But I do not want to go deeper into that because that is not my, I do not, I could not expand further exact except for the whole concept that if I see a woman, a Filipino woman is a subaltern because she does not have or doesn't have a voice within the norm or is still trying to f find a voice within the norm. Going into labor on Marxist, it's not my specialty. So I, 
it would still be part of the literature review, but going deeper into it would not be something that I would indulge in. Because to be honest with you, we had this discussion as well. I'm doing a BA dissertation, so and I'm only given eight eight thousand eight thousand words. And so at the end of the day, I've already almost covered my literature review. And then my supervisor said, "Explain further." So I'm like, "How could I explain further? You're only giving me eight thousand words, <laughs> and I have to have more analysis word, word count in my analysis." I, I have to. That's that's where I'm heading towards as well. Yes. In other words, labor is central to the very formation of the psychological states of these people. Right. Never thought of it that way. Because it begins with the question of separation, right? That, I mean, the condition of the overseas mother is that she is always under. Right. Mother is, and, and once separated, becomes other, both other to the uh, uh, families that she's working for. Right? Uh. Yes. Right? And so that, that process of other is precisely impossible to precisely facilitate it by by demands of capital. And it's a demands of capital or, or orders that temporal relationships and the spatial relationships between the mother and the kids and everyone else. Mm. Right. So you're going to have a very verified, okay. contextualized account of overseas contract labor's psychic life. But, right, yes. Um, I get your point, but at the same time, it's quite difficult for... Um, I will go deeper into uh, discussion. The, the, the issue that I always have with regards to labor is no doubting that mothers are let's say women for, for my study mothers, it's always been constructed as objects already at the end of the day. Othering equals objects and it's the same thing in psychoanalysis. You always other the mother. Um, there's no doubting on that. It's very explicit in psychoanalysis. What we are always encouraged as well is can you see a mother who is not an object? So if I bring labor into the into the picture or into uh, the dissertation, then I am already objectifying the mother. Okay, so, okay. Right, yes. It's work. Okay. It's work. I mean, to be an agent is to have the capacity to enter into a transformative relationship with the world and with yourself, right? And that transformative relationship is usually what is denoted by the notion of labor. Okay. I mean, I don't know what else you would call it. You can't talk about agency without talking about this transformative relationship. Right, yes. Is the question. But thank you. No, no, it's not about 8,000 words. It's about how do you change the categories of your analysis? How many words do you have to write? It's like, how do you transfer it? Once again, it's a question. Yeah. So that it's not, so you don't talk about agency in this sort of, because there's always the danger that you end up talking about agency in this most weird way. But can I ask, though, with regards to agency, I mean, there are different definitions of agency as well, right? So as long as I 
pin down my own definition of agency, then I can work with that own definition and then and, and expand it further, I suppose. Perhaps, I mean, some people would rather do that. My own preference is to sort of think about agency as something that comes out of the conditions that we're looking at. So rather than say, this is my definition of agency, that's what I'm going to look at in these mothers I'm looking for. Why not, since you have this rich archive of interviews, mm. why not look at those interviews and say, this is how they think about the agency? But it looks sort of similar to the Charlene was talking about, right? I mean, this is mm. why she does these interviews because she's interested in trying to figure out how these women make sense of their own situation. Mm. That's how agency works. Is you sort of look at, look, you listen. I mean, again, psychoanalytic, right? This is a talking cure. Mm. That's the first thing you do in psychoanalysis is mm. you listen to what, uh, what, the, what the patient is saying, what the, what the patient or analyzer is saying. And then, and then from, from, from their discourse, then you begin to make sense of how they make sense of it. So it's not about you making sense of their world. It's about you making sense of how they make sense of their world. Right. So in that sense, you don't begin with saying, oh, OK, this is my definition of agency. You begin by saying, what is their definition of agency? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And Thank you. Know, <laughs> Probably it'll get better, but thank you. Okay. Okay, hi everybody. So I'm Caroline. Um, I'm going to present something on my PhD research. Um, and this is basically a working paper I've published with the economics department here at SOAS. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of sort of what I've done and the conclusions that I've drawn from this. Um, so I'm looking at the palm oil industry in the Philippines, and I'm engaging with commodity chains literatures and trying to combine it with land literatures. So in particular, with respect to the Philippines, I'm looking at land reform literatures. So just to give you a quick overview, not to go too much, too much into detail. So what is land redistribution? Um, so it's basically, as Boras defines it, the net transfer of wealth and power from the landed to the landless and to land poor classes. Um, so as a result, within the chain literature, you would assume, theoretically speaking, that redistributive land reform would imply sort of social and economic upgrading opportunities. So if you would give people um, land, that they would have they, have, the, they have the opportunity to make this land productive and then get income from that and so on. So um, basically, it would imply increase in productivity, growth and output, and at the same time also reduce poverty. Um, so theoretically speaking, surprisingly, land has not Got, um, has not gotten recently uh, any prominent position within the chain literature and has been mostly fixated on capital and to a lesser extent more recently on labor. Um, so what I'm trying to do in this paper is I'm trying to integrate land and its relationship to capital and labor um, into this understanding of commodity chains, with, in, especially looking at um, the Philippines and the Palmo Valley chain. And what are sort of the consequences to economic and social up and downgrading trajectories? Um, so I used a case study of the CARP, the Co Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program, um, in the oil palm industry in Agusan del Sur, so in Mindanao. So what is the CARP? Um, I'm not sure if, if you're familiar with it, but this is just a quick overview. Um, so it was basically instigated under Aquino in 1988, and it follows the land to the tiller logic. So you give land from, from um, the landed to the landless, basically. Um, and it was distinct from previous attempts of land reform in the Philippines in that it was mainly driven by revolutionary and social movements, which were promoted by the pe peasantry. And this was mostly in, in protest against the corrupt and very high unequal um, land distribution in the Philippines. So already Anderson pointed out that basically the monopolization of land ownership and the control of that land by the landed class was the result of the increasing concentration of land ownership during Spanish and U.S. colonial times. So the CARP um, initially was supposed to run for 10 years, so until 1998, and it was supposed to redistribute 10.3 million hectares. Um, but it has fell short of its targets. Um, it was concluded in 2014, but it has been again extended and is still not sure where the CARP is going from here on. And at the moment, around 8 million hectares have been um, distributed. So the maximum you can get is 3 hectares. So usually you would um, get something from like sometimes 0 0.5 hectares to maximum 3 hectares. 
Um, just shortly about my methods. So this is part of my PhD field work. Um, and this is basically um, reliant on qualitative methods. Um, so I did participant observations, semi-structured interviews, and focus group discussions. And I matched it with some of, some of the data that I collected um, during my field work. Um, there's not much secondary literature on the oil palm industry in the Philippines in general. And then with particular focus on Agus Andesu also um, not, not that much. So my, my, PhD, my PhD itself focuses on the whole industry in the Philippines, but in this paper I just focus on Agus and Desur because there you can see the dynamics of the agrarian reform on um, dynamics on the ground. And yeah, I basically try to um, interview everybody that's sort of involved in production and in the milling operations. Um, yeah, and I used NVivo for my qualitative data analysis. So just a quick overview on the Filipino oil palm chain. So it's, it's a rather recent uh, development in the Philippines. So it was mainly pushed by development agencies such as the IMF and the World Bank. And it was in support of export-oriented industrialization. So Marcos heavily supported the development of the oil palm industry in that it would earn him foreign currency for exports. So to give you some numbers, between 2000 and 2014, oil palm production increased by 79% and the area itself increased by 244%. So that already gives you a hint in terms of productivity, that area, total area increased, but oil palm production didn't increase proportionately. And some of these issues are related to land issues. Um, at the moment, there's around 19,000 hectares that are um, producing oil palm, which is relatively small compared to other Southeast Asian producers. Um, and it's mostly in Mindanao. And recently there has been, since the mid 2000s, there has been expansions, Palawan, which has around 10,000 hectares and Bohol, which has around 6,000 hectares. So if you're around the touristy areas, you might be able to go a bit off the track and visit some of the open plantations. Um, the way in which I look at the chain is that it's mainly bio-driven, which means basically that, so oil palm is, is a fruit crop. So it's, so it's sort of the cousin of the coconut. Um, it's a palm tree which grows fruits and from these fruitlets you can extract oil um, and you need to mill the, the fruits within 48 hours. So that basically means that you need to be relatively close to the mill, otherwise your fruits will be pointless. And in the case of the Philippines, um, the fruits are usually not used for, for local consumption, whereas if you look at West Africa, for instance, it's used in their local cuisine. This is where the plant actually originates from. Um, so that basically, basically means if you're an oil palm producer, you need to have a mill around you to which you can sell your oil palm. But because the grower is dependent on that mill, that mill can basically exert disproportionate power over the, these production units. Um, so as a result, these producers are basically price takers and they have to take whatever the mill is suggesting. Also because it's a big capital investment, you don't have many mills next to each other. So usually if you're within a certain area, maximum there will be two mills you can actually sell to. Usually there's only one mill in your area, so you have to sell to this particular mill. So in Agusan del Sur, basically how the CARP uh, was implemented is that you had large-scale plantation companies that were from Malaysia, that were previously invited by the Marcos government, and because the Philippine land reform was implemented, these plantation companies were basically accommodated with a so-called leaseback arrangement to keep these transnational companies within the country because you didn't want to lose them and that they would go elsewhere. So basically how that worked is that um, the land was redistributed as a collective title to the plantation laborers. So you had a plantation company that got the land previously assigned by Marcos as so-called alienable and disposable land, which basically means it wasn't used, which obviously also wasn't true because you had a lot of indigenous people um, living on this land and living from the land. But this is how Marcos declared the land as sort of public lands. Um, and when the land reform was implemented, this land was then, it had to undergo land reform and it was basically given to the workers of these plantation companies. And then there was a condition attached to this that this land also had to be leased back at the same time back to the plantation company. So that effectively meant that the control over the land and the power over the land was not redistributed to the, to the beneficiaries, but actually was maintained by these milling companies. These leaseback arrangements were usually entered for 25 years, and it implied a fixed rent over 635 pesos per hectare per year. So if you would sort of look at it from an average perspective, if you would have three hectares per person, you would get around $78 per year or per day, something like 20 cents. Um, so the aim of the land reform was to 
create livelihoods for people and to sort of make them independent of um, other sources of income, so sort of develop agriculture development in the Philippines. But obviously, if you look at how much these people would earn per day, um, that wouldn't necessarily um, lead up to that. So what instead was happening in these oil plantations um, with respect to land reform is that the interests of these big multinational corporations were protected. So therefore, no actual transfer of power and wealth was, um, was gained. So the CARP essentially thereby restricts the expansion of plantation because that means if, if you have a plantation company now that wants to expand its operation, it means you have to negotiate with all these people that only have three hectares, right? So if you want to extend by 10,000 hectares, that means you have to talk to a lot of people. Um, just to be able to get some sort of more uh, production. So with, with oil palm, something would only become um, profitable 4,000 hectares and up. So it means you, have, you need to have large-scale plantations. CARP at the same time also didn't lead to the promised increase of productivity, as I hinted on before. Actually, what it had led to is decreasing yields and no replanting. Um, so basically, these plantation companies push back the responsibility of investing into land back to the landowners and back to the cooperatives that were that were um, managing these collective titles. So say you have a collective title, one company gets two collective titles. So 8,000 hectares might be split up into 4,000 hectares. Those 4,000 hectares are split up into three hectares each. So you have a cooperative who takes care of each title, so 4,000 people. So the plantation company, when it comes to investments into the land, would push back that responsibility back to the um, cooperatives. At the same time, these um, plantation companies also this is not unique, obviously, to the oil palm, oil palm sector. This is uh, happening in all sorts of agricultural sectors in the Philippines. And beyond that also is union busting, so the retrenchment of workers and thereby the contractualization. As a result, actually, land reform beneficiaries, they become workers themselves on their own land and are employed in precarious work. So as a conclusion, as I said before, um, Land, the land reform program has not led to an actual transfer of power and wealth from the land to the landless, wherein the milling companies were able to retain the control over the land and over the profits. Um, thereby, the CARP has actually led to exacerbating social inequalities between workers and cooperatives and has led to their marginalization. And there are similar findings in other sectors, like the other plantation sectors, like banana and pineapple. So theoretically speaking, what I'm arguing is that you, you need to bring back the question of land into commodity studies to understand un, uh, the underlying power distributions and the changing distributions if changes happen to land and the way in which then um, power structures along the chain, along the commodity chain actually change. Um, Policy-wise, the Department of Agrarian Reform continues belief in these collective cloa. So it continues these things that giving land to a group of people and not giving them the decision power over their own plot of land um, is the way to go forward, thereby um, not only, but obviously also ignoring all the overlapping land claims that have been made, um, especially in the Mindanao context. So as I stated before, the land was um, stated to be alienable and disposable by markers, but previously they've obviously had also been other people living on the land, which until today are making claims to the land. And Duterte specifically uses um, the oil palm industry as a vehicle of peace. So if you've recently maybe read the news, so he's basically suggesting the Mauta members should go to Malaysia to um, learn about rubber and oil palm so that they, when they come back, they have a new means of livelihood. Um, and this has been actually already been done in Mangindanao and Zamboanga. So what I've been, I didn't go to these areas, but I've been to um, Sultan Kudarat and uh, the people I interviewed there were telling me that it had been successful in transforming terrorists into peaceful oil palm growers in the area. Um, so this is something, if somebody's interested and wants to do some research there, I think that's a very interesting piece of research. Okay, thank you, that's it. So if you have any questions, I know this is not necessarily related to your guys' work, uh, but oh, just if you have questions about details of the study or anything. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So how do you come to that? It's like we didn't have a Taiwan. 
Yeah. Korea, yeah. Japan. You know, you had real serious money. Yeah. Right? And so people would always say, well, that's the real economic development. But in the case of the Philippines, first of all, is that, is that an accurate assessment? Is that an accurate case where the Atlanta farms are chronically failing because of that? But, you know, that's yeah. Really yeah. So, it's very difficult to say. I mean, it depends on sort of which sectors you look at, which which agricultural crop, but I mean, from what I see from the oil palm, it's difficult to see positive sides, to be honest, because these people are also not, a lot of times these people are not just dependent on the land, right? They have other sources of income, so they just use it as an additional source of income. So the aim of the land reform was actually to develop agriculture and to get this, this peasantry growing and to strengthen this peasantry, but I'm not sure whether this is happening with the oil palm industry, because these people are... Some of these people live in urban areas and then just have another plot of land. So it's also restricted in terms of how much land you can own, but there's obviously this whole illegal trade going on, illegal trade going on where people accumulate more because others maybe don't use it. So some people have actually 100 hectares instead of just three. So how would you change it? How would I change it? You were in charge of policy, how would you change it? In terms of land reform, I mean, so I think there's an issue with the oil palm generally. Um, so this is industrial agriculture. So that in itself, I think, limits the development potential of an agricultural backbone of the country because it's not, it's agri-industry, it's not agriculture per se. Um, so I would start actually from there saying that maybe plantation agriculture is not the way to go. So you can see in pineapple and banana, that's not developing your peasantry. You actually, what you're actually creating is farm workers that have precarious jobs and maybe have some land somehow with the plantation that's leased to the plantation, but then actually landowners working on their own plot of land. I mean, these people don't even know where their land is. So they get a collective title of 4,000 hectares, but they don't know where their land is. It has never been designated to them. It's just collectively you own this now. And then they're stuck also, right? So you cannot just get out of it. And no, you cannot. I mean, you can inherit it or anything, something, but you cannot, you cannot say, I want to take now my three hectares out and I want to do something more productive. Yeah. You cannot. You're stuck with that cooperative who is, who's managing everything. And that's the issue with the DAR, because the DAR still insists that this is the way to go, because it's accommodating for these plantation companies' interests. But it's not acknowledging that, even though this has been going on for so long, that actually... Nothing has changed in terms of agriculture. I think that the problem also is that because there are other sources of income, and I mean, we've talked about OFWs and everything. I mean, the areas that I've went to, obviously a lot of people have families abroad and they get additional sources of income, whether it's urban or whether it's abroad. So the, there seems to be some developmental impact in terms of changes of what you see outside from in the villages and it's actually developing. But in terms of working conditions or conditions in the plantation, yeah, that's, nothing has actually changed. It's gotten worse. I mean, there has been a lot of union busting, so there's barely any unions left. So the voices of the plantation laborers are basically silenced um, and they become contractualized. So you have this law in the Philippines that you cannot be employed more than six months if you're a contractual labor. So you're, the five and a half months, um, they're employed by some contractual labor agency. And then after that, they go to another agency and then they're five and a half months employed there. So then they just start switching around. But yeah, effectively, they are long-term employees on a contractual basis. And this is, again, not unique just to oil palm. This is in all plantation industries in the Philippines. And obviously, there's a general issue towards the neglect of agriculture within policymaking, within policymaking discourse, because um, it's seen as something remote, something of we have overcome sort of thing. Yeah. We should focus on the service industry, the manufacturing, um, these sort of more yeah sexy topics. <laughs> so I think, um, I mean, if, especially if you look at people who, who do not have the means to go to the urban centers or who, who do but don't have the education, Bringing people back into rural areas, I think, is something very important and could be, yeah, could imply some meaningful development. Um, but yeah, I mean, if I look at my mom, who's from the rural areas of Mindanao, none of the children actually continue to like run some of the coconut plantations, obviously. So 
Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the land issue in the Philippines is quite particular, I would say. Because um, you also have the issue of... So there's this indigenous law of 1998, I think, the Ypres law. So what they have been... Because of the carp and expansion of plantation has become difficult, what now these plantation companies are doing is actually targeting those native lands that have been formalized into, into titles for their native communities. So you have areas in Agusan and Azur that might be 2,000, 3,000 hectares large that are, they have a title for that spe specific indigenous community. Um, and now these companies go in and try to obviously convince certain people within those community to lease their land to these companies. And that obviously introduces all sorts of issues within these communities and power structures within those communities. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, in terms of, obviously policy is always embedded in a cultural or political context, but in terms of formal policy, like what's yeah. allowed and what's not allowed under land reform, is the, the structure of the policy in the Philippines unique, or, or are other land reforms policies in different contexts like quite similar, and they just play out differently? Yeah, because of these yeah. I mean, the so it's the land to the tiller logic, which yeah. happened in a lot yeah. of different places. The way, though, in the Philippines it happened was very slow and very much like, I mean, if you look at Aquino, for instance, they have their famous Hacienda Lucita, so that never underwent land reform. So you had an attempt, but it was never a serious attempt. So this is very much different from places like Vietnam or other Southeast Asian countries, where land reform was pushed through within like a certain amount of time. And that just never, until now, never happened in the Philippines. So Hacienda Lucita is still up in the air. Um, it's still under the Aquinos. Um, so you still have like big families like the Floriandos in, in Mindanao who are still have yeah, interest in the... So they also had to undergo land reform and gave it back to the plantation laborers. Similar story to this one. But obviously in the end they still held the, the power over the profits and power over the land. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It is a bit like a. It's like some sort of illusion of having land, but you don't even know where your land is. Thanks. So my name is Danica, and I'm an historical lexicographer. So I'm world English editor for the Oxford English Dictionary. So I'm here to talk about something a bit lighter, which is words. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to start first with um, some background on the history of lexicography in the Philippines. So lexicography, the creation of dictionaries. And actually, as I mentioned before in one of the um, previous talks, uh, we, if there is something that we owe to the Spanish friars, is that they actually contributed a lot to the preservation of many of our languages. Because in the 16th and 17th centuries, they started to write dictionaries of, of several Philippine languages. So that includes Tagalog, Kapampangan. And, um, and, uh, this continued on even until the 19th century. And for some of these languages, these uh, dictionaries written in the Spanish period are still perhaps the best um, existing documentation for these languages. Now, f as far as Amer um, the Americans, their contribution to Philippine lexicography has been a bit more limited. So there have been some studies by anthropological linguists during the American period, but still very limited compared to what the Spanish friars did, because they did this as part of their Christianizing mission, you know. Um, but uh, what did happen in the American period that was very important for lexicography in the Philippines is that was when Tagalog was officially adopted as the basis of the national language. And, um, 
And the need to standardize this newly created lingo franca provided renewed stimulus for more lexicographical activity in the islands. So the national language movement in the 1920s and 30s, and there were also after the Second World War some efforts to promote this new national language because, because as you all know, the fact that Tagalog became the basis of Filipino was not exactly an idea that everybody in the Philippines embraced, especially those people who didn't exactly speak Tagalog as a native language. And And so this is a time when um, in the 1980, uh, so talking about uh, dictionaries of the national language, some of the most important ones that have been published is the one that was published by the Commission on Filipino Language in 1989, the Diccionario ng Wigong Filipino. And this was later followed by the UP Diccionario Filipino edited by Virgilio Almario, which first came out in 2001. And then there was a second edition that came out in 2010. But the thing with these dictionaries is that, as I've mentioned before, they are, um, they are not still what we would call evidence-based dictionaries. So you just have um, editors basically telling you what they think these words mean. But they've just started a new research project in, in, in UP now to create a new dictionary of Filipino that will be based on actual language corpora, on actual evidence of, of language use. But, but it's still in its very early stages, but there's a lot of hope for So I'm very, very excited about how that project is going to, um, to turn out. And then as far as the Philippine variety of English, there have also been some attempts to codify them. So most notably, there is the Anvil Macquarie Dictionary of Philippine English for high school. So, but although there are these um, sort of um, attempts to document Philippine English, um, if you ask a, any Filipino who wants to buy a dictionary of English, they wouldn't go and ask for, a, maybe an American would, would, would naturally buy a Webster dictionary, but a Filipino would, would also buy a Webster dictionary and not a Philippine English dictionary. And as far as lexicography is concerned, American English still reigns supreme in, in the Philippines and Webster's is still the dictionary of choice since American English is the basis of English in, in the Philippines. Now, but then, then you wonder how, how is the Philippines represented in, in this dictionary? So um, as early as 1970, there's been a study by, by um, Yap where she looked at Webster's New International Dictionary of the English Language of 1961. So, and also Webster's Third, which came out in 1968. And she looked for, so painst and so we're talking about paper dictionary here. So she painstakingly looked for anything that's related to the Philippines in the dictionary. And she found that they are these types of words. So, um, so as you can see that these words are words of mostly botanical, zoological, and anthropological interest that date back to the American colonial period. But obviously these are not the type of words that a speaker of Philippine English would be using in their everyday life. But it's not only in English dictionaries that the Philippines has made a mark. So um, I recently have just been looking at Nina y Costumbres Filipinas, which is a, a novel that was written by Pedro Paterno that was published in 1885. And it was really, I mean, it's a really horrible book. I mean, as a, as a novel, it's just, it's like worse than any teleserie currently on air. I mean, it's just really, I mean, horrible as, as a novel. I mean, it's no no limitang here, that's for sure. But, but what was interesting about this, this um, this book is that there's so many, it's written in Spanish, but there's so many Philippine, uh, Filipino words in it. So words from Tagalog and other Philippine languages. And some of them are actually recorded in the Diccionario de la Lengua Española of the Spanish Royal Academy. And perhaps my most favorite of all these words is, um, is uh, tabo, which is, which until now you can, if, if, you, I mean, if you can read Spanish, it's available, the, the dictionary of the Real Academia is available online, so you can search for it, and Tabo is there. And it's, um, it's defined as una vacía filipina hecha con la cáscara interior y durísima del coco. So when I was adding the same word to the OED a couple of years ago, I updated the Spanish definition a bit by recognizing the Tabo's modern form. So I defined it as a dipper used to scoop up water from a pail or bucket while washing, traditionally made of coconut shell or bamboo, but now more commonly made of plastic. So, so the Spanish only recognize the coconut one, but who uses coconut tabo anymore, right? So we mostly use plastic. Um, 
So I thought it was interesting to look at Ninay because most research now on field Hispanic literature is done from a literary perspective. But as a lexicographer, I find it interesting that, that literature can also be used for, for le lexical investigations. And it makes me wonder, you know, what can Rizal tell us about the evolution of our vocabulary? And how about the other propagandists? And how about the writers of the golden age of Hispanic literature? You know, people like Claro M. Recto, Jesus Balmori, Cecilia Apostol, Evangelina Guerrero. So if you look at, at these books, like what borrowings and other types of lexical innovation can we find in, in these um, examples of Hispanic literature? So when I first arrived at OUP six years ago, so I was very interested to find out how the Philippines is represented in the OED. And what makes the OED particularly special is that it's a historical dictionary. So apart from you know, the definitions, pronunciations, and you know, the typical information that you can find in any dictionary, you can, what, what, the other thing that you can find in the OED is actual historical evidence of the word being used. So for every entry, you will find the earliest uh, citations starting from the first pos the, f the earliest use of the word in either in in, writ in written English so as, a, as a, an OED editor my task apart from defining a word is finding the earliest as you know as far as we are able to find the earliest usage of a word in English so um, this makes the OED a very a quite a valuable resource for historical inv uh, investigations. So from my very first day of work, I scoured the OED for all evidence of the Philippines. And it can be said just by looking at the examples I have on this slide that Filipino borrowings that I found in the OED at the time are still mostly in, you know, in the Webster word category. So they still all refer to plants and animals, terms for ethnic origin and cultural items. And only a few of them can be considered to form part of our actual everyday vocabulary. Yeah, and then, so where do we get the quotations for Philippine words? So it depends on how old the word is. So if it's old enough, so the interesting thing is there are words in the OED that are from the Philippines, but date back from even decades before English itself came to the Philippines with the Americans. So there are words that have quotation evidence from the 1700s, and they come from translations into English of descriptive accounts written in Spanish. And then you also have quotations from the 1800s to early 1900s from travel accounts written by English-speaking authors who have actually traveled to the Philippines. Um, and then if you look at the selection of words from the Philippines in the OED, you, uh, it's striking to see the kind of stratification of Philippine vocabulary that Bolton and Butler described in a 2008 article. So first you have the temporal stratification. So, um, the first layer is the contemporary Philippine English that you all use in the Philippines. And then the second layer is the colonial era vocabulary that seems to be the only ones that are represented in dictionaries. And then there's also the social stratification that we can see if we, if we, if we, if we compare what sort of words in Philippine English are derived from Tagalog and which ones are derived from Spanish. Um, so for instance, if you look at words in the OED, Philippine English words in the OED that are from Spanish, they're usually related to law, government, and administration. So presidente or sala, meaning, meaning a courtroom or a court of law, whereas those from Philippine languages pertain to the rural environment and beliefs of farmers and fisher folk. So words like anting-anting or um, palay. So you can even just by looking at which words get into the dictionary and from which languages they come from, you can already see the sort of um, the hierarchies of languages that we have been talking about in, in the Philippines. So Spanish is up there being used by the people who run the country and Tagalog is down there. Tagalog and other Philippine English is down there being used by farmers and fishermen. Um, and actually one cool thing that you can do now, you know, a lot of people tell me that um, ask me whether there's going to be ever another print edition of the OED. Um, the answer is, I don't know. I'm not officially allowed to say. <laughs> but, but I don't think so, because if we were to publish the third edition that we're working on right now in print, it would be up to 40 volumes. And who's going to buy 40 volumes of a dictionary? So the current edition of the OED is just exclusively available online. But I don't know why people are so nostalgic over print dictionaries, because I would 
I mean, I still read novels and paper, but I would choose a, a digital dictionary anytime because a digital dictionary allows you to do cool things like this. So you can actually choose um, by using different categories, of you um, create timelines of words in the OED. So for example, I'm interested in words coming from Tagalog. So just by clicking on a few buttons, I generated this um, graph which shows you the, uh, so the 55 Tagalog words currently in the OED, when did they come in? And, and so you can see the pattern. So, um, so I mean, it's quite obvious that 19, the early 1900s was the peak of borrowing into English from Tagalog. And that actually historically makes sense because the early 1900s was when the Americans came. And that's when they all started absorbing these Tagalog words into the OED. So it's very interesting. And you can do that using um, many other categories. If you want to know how many French words are in English, there's a lot. And how many of them in which century came into the English language, you can do that. If you want to know how many words from, I don't know, from baseball came into English and when they came in, you can also generate that using this tool. So, so that's really cool. Anyway. So that's what was what the the status of it, what was the status of Philippine English when I first arrived there. But I'm glad to report now that we have started to remedy things. And in 2015, um, the OED published 40 new words and senses from Philippine English, which was the largest single batch of items from this variety to be added by the dictionary. And this was followed by the publication of dozens more Philippine editions in subsequent quarterly updates. Now, these were inclusions were widely covered in the Philippine press and were generally met with a positive response by the Filipino public. So Kilig, which is added to the OED in its March 2016 update, was one item which attracted a remarkable amount of media attention. And it became, until now, it's one of the dictionary's most consulted entries ever. Like every time they show us the graph of most visited entries, it's like it's there at the top. I mean, Filipinos with their computers, right? Um, and, but the most important thing about this is that in its most recent Philippine updates, the OED also extended the scope of its coverage. So veering away from the typical flora and fauna words to include other semantic domains relevant to Filipino life and culture. So from greetings to indigenous sports to items of traditional dress. And then Philippine food and food customs are also an especially rich source of new words for us. And so our kinship terms in terms of address for both men and women. So, and other newly added words also refer to archetypal Filipino traits and values. So just some examples you can see on, on this slide. And Philippine, um, Philippine English borrowings can also be highly productive. So they they readily fuse with other words to create hybrid expressions that combine English and Tagalog and even English and Spanish. And although borrowing is predominant, the OED also ensured that its selection of new items included examples of other means by which words are created in Philippine English. So there's calking, for instance, or the direct translation of an expression to one, from one language to another. So for instance, we added the use of the, of the verb to go down a vehicle instead of to get off. Because Filipinos say, oh, if you want to go to um, Glorieta, you have to go down at Ayala. <laughs> Is that the Ayala station? Yeah. Um, instead of to get off, because that's a translation of the Tagalog verb bumaba, because you have the same word for to get off and to go down. And Filipinos also adapt existing English words to express a local concept that's alien to Anglo-American culture. So for instance, in the use of the expression dirty kitchen, to me, not actually a dirty kitchen, but one where everyday cooking is done, as opposed to the one that's just for show. <laughs> yeah. And then English speakers in the Philippines can also you know, completely change the meaning of a word. So in the Philippines, gimmick is a fun night out with friends, while to salvage is not to save, although that's now an old-fashioned term. I prefer to say EJK or Tokhang now. Um, and words can also be converted from one part of speech to another. So in the Philippines, you, we can use high blood as an adjective. So you can say, oh, this traffic jam is making me high blood. Um, and we also like make, we add derivational affixes like in precedentiable, and we invent new acronyms and initialisms like in K, KKB. So, 
And this small selection of neologisms, um, I hope I've shown how Filipinos experiment with words. So that's why I find it very interesting reading Professor Rafael's chapter in uh, Motherless Tongues about um, about uh, the chap that second chapter on words and how he commented on on words as play, because this is how what I love about um, Philippine English lexicography is you know just. Um, studying all the ways in which Filipinos experiment with words, pull them apart and put them back together. Then they mix up elements from all, they mix up all the elements of, from all the language they have at their disposal. And then they play with meaning, they play with function, and they play with form to express different concepts. Because the problem with us is we have a deficit mentality when it comes to using English. So we feel that since we don't speak like Americans, that there must be something wrong with the way that we speak. And just because we code switch a lot, it means that, that, that there's something wrong with us because we because we we can't just speak in straight English or straight Tagalog, but actually it's not. I mean, I code switch not because I can't speak English fully or I can't speak Tagalog fully. I code switch because I can. <laughs> and a lot of people can. And, and and when I code switch, it's because it's because of the person I'm talking to, it's because of the particular context that we're in, it's because of that particular thing I want to express. So there is a communicative value to code switching that, that somehow people find negative when in fact it's not. Um, and perhaps, you know, I, I always get asked as well what my favorite word is, and I try not to play favorites with my words because, you know, but I do have a favorite word. <laughs> and it's one that we added very recently, and it's chapo. And it's a, so I don't know, well, if for those of you who don't know what a chapo is, it's a der derogatory name for a politician perceived as belonging to a conventional and corrupt ruling class. And the word fuses together the component words of the English phrase traditional politician, but the resulting blend is also the word for a dirty old rag used in Tagalog and other Philippine languages. Do you use that in Visaya too, Trabot, Mia? So it's used in Tagalog and other Philippine languages because it itself comes from the Spanish word trapo, which is still used in Spanish to mean rag. So this makes chapo not only a convenient contraction, but also a vivid, highly effective metaphor that likens a corrupt politician to a filthy, disposable scrap of cloth, which I find really great. And as a word that combines influences from English, Spanish, and Philippine languages, it distills centuries of Philippine political, cultural, and linguistic history into five letters. So it's my favorite word. Um, so the interesting thing about dictionaries in the Philippines is that there, the history, of um, the history of lexicography has always been linked to the country's colonial past and post-colonial struggle to establish a unique national identity. I mean, that's why we can't even agree how to spell our word, our own words. And because of this, the national language development is still incomplete, and consequently, Philippine national dictionaries lack the prestige that similar dictionaries have in other countries. I mean, we cannot underestimate how, Web, how Noah Web, the role that Noah Webster played in making American English distinct from British English, for example. So, but then, because of this, uh, American English continues to exert considerable influence on English usage in the Philippines, discouraging many of the stakeholders from investing effort and resources in dictionaries produced at home. So we're still looking at Webster. We don't buy Oxford dictionaries. We'll see how, what we can do about that. <laughs> But, but yeah, but for us, dictionaries is still Webster because we can't provide a better alternative. I think that the addition of the Philippine English lexicon to the OED can help remedy the situation. So first, by incorporating Philippine words into this such a prestigious dictionary means applying its long and renowned dictionary making tradition and cutting edge research methods to the study of Philippine English and becoming part of the OED will aid in the legitimization of Philippine English as it is an acknowledgement that this particular variety is as worthy of serious linguistic scholarship as older, more established varieties like British and American English. And such recognition can bring about this a, a change in attitude towards Philippine English and hopefully pave the way to greater acceptance of, of any locally edited English dictionaries that may be attempted in the future. So that's it. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> yes. This is this is just a question out of curiosity, but do we have three Spanish colonial records of um, indigenous Philippine languages as well? Were there any sorts of writing systems? Uh, 
there's the writing system um ali uh, well well actually it's uh the the technical the term for it the correct term for it is by buy-in um it's uh it's tagalog right is it the tagalog system? and actually i don't know if you've heard that recently it's just been made law that it's that it's going to be like going to is it still pending or yeah um but I don't know. I don't know for what reason. I mean, I I think it's just uh, it's just symbol. I mean, I think I think it's great like to see it on like maybe street signs. That if, if only for aesthetic reasons, I think the, this this script is absolutely beautiful. I love it. But 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 before spending money on that, spend money on studying it first. I mean, spend money on research on it first. Um, because really, we don't know that much about it, considering that it's it's our. Um, Indigenous, indigenous writing system. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know that much about it. But but there are some words that in in Philippine English that date back to be pre-colonial Philippines. And one one important example is barangay, which which we mentioned earlier. So barangay is a pre-Hispanic concept. Um, so it comes from a Malay root meaning the the boats that that um, that the Malay um, the Malay communities traveled in. And those became the, uh, the the kind of the nucleus of the, of the initial the, the community the Tagalog pre-colonial Tagalog communities. And then, but the the word endured as part of the Philippine political system. And even until now, it's still an important word for us. And from a lexicographical perspective, from a lexicological perspective, it's very very productive. Because apart from barangay, we have barangay captain, barangay tanod, barangay elections, barangay certificate. <laughs> so it's so it, it, a lot of words are created around the concept of barangay. I think we just had a barangay election yesterday. So that's one. And, and datu is a word that we share also with, with, um, with other um, Austronesian languages that we, still, that we still use. So that's a name for a local chieftain. So many of, of, of these Malay words of Malay roots still, still endure in Philippine English today. Hmm? Datu, really? Dato. Glot, glot. But is it like current? Is is it like current? It's current? Like so someone drives by in a fancy car and go like, who Dato? Oh. I mean, cannot. That's awesome. I, I love that. I love that so much. I'm, go I'm going to use it. I'm going to make it a thing. What's the connotation? Is it for like land? The yeah, that, that's the thing. Because in Tagalog, dato implies nobility. You inherit it. It's not. Yeah. Mm. And also, it's, it's it's a noun in Tagalog. But are you saying that it's an adjective also in 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 Bisaya? That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oops. Yeah, yes. Okay. So I'm, as I said, uh, I'm not going to talk for long because I realize I'm the last person, and it's been a long day. It's been a super interesting day. Um, so yeah, thanks for organising it. It's been uh, uh, really interesting hearing all the different papers. Um, seeing as I'm working with the Philippines, but I'm kind of quite isolated from other kind of Philippine studies people. Um, so, uh, my name is Raphael Schachter, I'll start with that. I'm a teaching fellow uh, at UCL, just around the corner in the anthropology department. Um, so, I um, did my master's and my PhD there working broadly on uh, public art or independent public art, non-institutional and institutional practices um, of art making uh, in the public sphere. Um, for my postdoc, which I finished, well, I, the funding ended uh, quite recently. I had a three-year postdoc where I was exploring contemporary art practices in the Philippines. Um, that was initially uh, supposed to be looking at um, the kind of relationship between politics, religion, and the arts, following um, the Deo Cruz's uh, Protiesmo exhibition about five years ago, um, which uh, was a very famous moment uh, in kind of uh, public culture in the Philippines, because the exhibition was eventually closed by Imelda Marcos, um, and there was an exorcism by the Archbishop 
of Manila. It was like a moment where the art world really entered into the public culture uh, of the Philippines more widely. Uh, it was also a perfect moment with which to uh, brand my, um, my uh, uh, postdoc application to get funding. Uh, and then uh, when I arrived, things changed. And what changed was um, the Philippines was returning um, to the Venice Biennale for the first time in 49 years, uh, which was a very grand and kind of important moment for the contemporary art in the Philippines. So I decided that that really should be kind of the main point of focus for my project, in that what was super interesting to me was to see how artists uh, in a specific context deal with the wider context of what is now called global art. So global art, uh, be it TM, being the a kind of the latest manifestation of uh, global art practice, of world art practice, of art practice traditionally called contemporary art, um, in a post-1989 context where the art world has moved away from the centres of London, New York and Paris and opened up to Beijing, Sao Paulo, Hong Kong, Manila. Um, this is the context that the art world is now inhabiting, uh, which in many ways uh, is a very uh, kind of progressive context where rather than relying on kind of traditional centres, uh, these centres have been displaced. Uh, that's kind of the idea of it. So, um, uh, which way should I go with this? Well, I'll, I'll continue on that. So, one of the things about uh, the context of global art is there's a really strong focus on the idea of the contemporary. Um, I should say, by the way, that this is uh, some videos of the work of Mark Atienza, who's a Dutch Latina artist um, who uh, will be working with myself and Christina at an exhibition at the Brunei Gallery next year, which I want to come to. Um, so, within this kind of like sphere of global art, there's a really strong emphasis on the idea of the contemporary, a progressive um, kind of intention uh, to create a coevalness throughout kind of the whole kind of sphere of global art. So rather than saying, uh, in a traditional sense, that um, the, you know, we in kind of the centre of the art world in London, New York, or Paris, are at the avant-garde, we're ahead of time, and those inquiries are belated, they're behind time. There's this idea within global art that there is this coevalness, this contemporariness throughout the whole of this kind of wider practice. Now that is, uh, you know, following the work of people like Johannes Fabian in anthropology. Uh, who was really critiquing kind of the background of the very roots of social science and anthropology in particular. I should say I'm an anthropologist, I mentioned that. Uh, hence working with that So one of the things about um, so Johannes Fagan's work where he really introduced this idea that time is used as a weapon. The time is used something with which to create an inequitable balance between you know, the self and the other. So in particular, um, with an anthropological context, go to your ethnographic location, you are coeval with your um, informants, your interlocutors, but then you go and write it up and you put them in a past tense, you put them in a background. This idea from kind of the whole history of social science that when you go outwards in space, you go backwards in time. And so with this idea, uh, this kind of way that colonialism has used time as a weapon historically, uh, within um, global art there is this kind of push towards the contemporary However, getting to the point, um, within that kind of um, enforcement of the contemporary, what I found is that this was actually something quite problematic. So rather than being something which had, uh, albeit a positive intention, it was something that in the location, in the specificity of Manila, I should kind of um, stress that I was in Manila rather than in the Philippines, um, in that, you know, getting to know, you know, getting to know a city like that, uh, take more than the seven months I was there. Um, so I kind of, you know, I don't know about the Philippine art scene, I know about the Manila art scene. Um, so, uh, you know, whilst being there, the kind of specificities of time, of the temporal, um, not only uh, through my own kind of ethnographic experiences, so traffic, which is vehicular traffic and internet traffic, um, the way that you work, the way that you function in, in that kind of site, being totally determined by, you know, Possibilities of movement, the possibilities of speed. Um, so, not only in an ethnographic context, that means something that constantly came to the fore. So, examples I talked about last year um, of um, you know um, friends, interlocutors trying to send files, video files to a, to a film festival in, in Hong Kong or Tokyo. The possibility of that. Uh, I was trying to work on projects I was doing here from there, which was totally impossible, as my files were huge. I mean, 
was then that I realised why all my uh, credit and artists sent me, you know, 150k image files rather than 15 gig image files that I really wanted. So time, not only being something which in my locality was something that became came to the fore in my field work, but also something that came to the fore in my performance, my interlocutors' practice. So. Um, Next year, um, across the way at Brunei Gallery, uh, I'm doing an exhibition as an output of well, one of the outputs of my postdoc. Uh, so not um, not impact, hopefully impact, but output of your own frame with the REC system. Um, so this is a project which is not simply about uh, a conclusion of my project. This is the answer, but something which is actually a methodology. So I, I kind of think that cura curation as methodology is something very important to my practice find out to create uh, not only spaces where I can have meetings with people who I'm like never giving meetings, uh, not only a space where I can take my interlocutors and say uh, four days in a room where we can brainstorm a project, I can steal their time otherwise in that way, um, but also a space from which I hope to learn, I hope to have research occur through that. So, that exhibition um, is all about belatedness, it's all about it's all about the temporal. It's all about the way that not only within art is there this uh, anxiety and influence of how we do this. There's this constant worry about what happened before you. But also with the post-colonial context, as Homi Barber and many others have discussed, how there is this violence and power of the Bayesian, the time lag, how there's always a separation between the center and the periphery in terms of the temporal dimension. So all the artists we're working with in the project, which will be occurring April next year, uh, are all focusing on this thing, producing new work, showing other work, which is itself focusing on the idea of the temporal. So three very quick examples. Uh, there's an artist called Mark, Mark Salvatus, who I'm working with, um, who produces work in which he, I'd say, excavates time. So he brings the past very much into the present, not simply in a mode of like archiving, um, but... Oh my God, they're coming. People are coming. Okay, so excavating, evacuating, and abstracting time. So Martha's work on the sea. Uh, they're coming in, they're coming in. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's talk about this further next April at Brunei Gallery, where if, none of you, if, if some of you are not attending, I'll be very, very angry. <laughs> so we'll continue the discussion at the conference, which Christina and myself will be putting on the exhibition next year. Thank you and good night. Thank you.